This is a mic text. One, two, one, two, check, check, check. Looks like we got a couple people rolling in this morning. We'll get started this here at about 10 a.m. One, two, one, two, uh, check, you should check, also check. have an email Looks like that we we'll provide you in this morning. We'll a link to at about 10 class itself one, two, one, um, for the Google Hangouts. Excuse me, let me mute the background. Uh, we do have a class link for the Google Hangouts that you guys are all welcome to join. Join the conversation, ask questions throughout the process. Or if you just want to hang out and watch the YouTube stream, more than welcome to also just sit back and enjoy. Time is now 940. We'll give it about 20 more minutes for everybody to kind of start rolling in. We'll get going.
Good morning and welcome to the stream. Again, we're going to get started here in Good morning just and under 15 to minutes. The stream. Again, we're going to start beginning the class today at around 10 o'clock. minutes. Like we have three of the start five beginning the class today at around 10 o'clock. As soon as everybody minutes. kind of arrives. Three of the start beginning the class today at around 10 o'clock. As soon as everybody kind of arrives, uh, we will begin our class today. I apologize for the feedback there. Just need a couple more people to arrive and we'll get going with uh, today's events. Also, as a reminder, if you have not already, please join the Google meeting, the Google Hangouts meeting I sent to your email. Uh, we'll go ahead and have a quick introductory discussion uh, in the Google Hangouts before today's live stream. And then again, if you want to ask questions throughout today's live feed, you can also do that throughout the Google Hangouts. Just about 10 minutes and we'll get going here.
All right, so it's about five minutes before we get going here. Uh, I just want to send another reminder to everybody that is viewing the live stream. Uh, we do have a Google Hangouts um, chat room where you can join and participate in the discussion. Uh, if you have not done so, please go ahead and take a moment to join the Google Hangouts. Um, and we'll have a quick little intro discussion on the Google Hangouts before we actually get into today's course. skipping in and out. Let me, uh, let me see. Sorry. I'm going to try and join this on my phone. I'll be back. Yeah, a lot better. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, I just said stream started too, man. Uh, yeah. I got, well, I, I, I found it before me.
Hey there, Ryan. Good morning. Doesn't look like I'm able to hear you. Um, if you have a microphone, you might need to change some settings if you're uh, looking to chat. Um, but it looks like we got two more people here we're waiting on, and then we will get started. Uh, David, the YouTube video right now does not have any, um, it just should say stream starting soon on your end. Uh, if anyone wants to confirm that for us out there, it should just say stream starting soon on the YouTube video. You shouldn't see a just black screen, you should see something. Uh, David, you might want to check your email. Are you sure you did you click the link that I sent you via the um, email this morning or YouTube should have sent you a uh, direct link to the event itself. So you should have an invite from YouTube for the event that you can click. You also need to make sure that the email address that you're logged into is also the same one associated with your order that you placed with Open Source Steel. Uh, we use that email in order to give you private access to the live stream. I'm going to change the screen now just so you guys can see that there is um, something being presented. Uh, if you do see the changes and if you're seeing the live feed, if you would just confirm that with me in the chat room, just say, hey, I'm seeing things. If you are not seeing the live feed, um, please also let me know in the comments. All right, Ryan says he sees it. So it looks like we are good on our end. So David, just make sure that you do have the correct link and that you have the right video open. Yes, so the e email address um, that is associated with the order, uh, you'll need to have that signed up with uh, the YouTube so that you can view the video. I sent you a private invite to that email address specifically. So if you're trying to access it from a different email address, it's likely going to have an error or not work. This is a private event today, so there's no access outside of the people invited. Ah. If you want, Ryan, um, that was something I was going to kind of discuss this morning. I was going to suggest that either A, I can just, when I'm talking and when I'm d doing the lecture today, I can just go ahead and mute myself within this chat, and then you guys can just listen to the YouTube video, um, and that way you guys can hear me directly. Good morning, Christina. How are you doing? Sorry, yeah. Can you hear me okay? People here. Oh, uh, yeah, mute it. <laughs> Can you hear us? Sounds like she's not able to hear us yet. 
Uh, but again, Ryan, if you need to, you can either mute the YouTube video um, and we can chat in here. But I, I think I'd prefer if I just, you mute, I'll mute myself within the Google Hangouts and then you guys can just listen to me through the YouTube video. I just want to make sure that everybody has both open before I just mute myself now. So we're just waiting on one more person. Uh, we're looking for Christian. Once Christian arrives here, uh, we'll get started. If we don't see Christian within the next three minutes or so, we will get going though. Uh, we have uh, quite a bit of content to cover today and I wanna make sure that we have enough time uh, to cover it all. Also, I know some of you are on the East Coast, so I wanna make sure that uh, we're covering adequate time. I know people have dinner and things going on. It is Saturday, so I wanna make sure I don't hold you here for too long today. Uh, but it is important that the information that we're gonna cover, uh, that uh, we, we really go through each detail so that each one of you has a proper understanding of the distillation process. Um, so we are gonna cover two things today. We're gonna cover one portion is going to be um, Admittedly, a little more boring than the other, but it is, it is essential. It is a requirement uh, in my eyes. We're going to go through a lecture where we're going to cover, uh, I'd say, a few hours of content, um, depending on how things go today. I, I'm, I'm going to try to keep things rolling. I don't want to keep, keep you guys bored at all. Uh, I want to keep you entertained. So throughout the day, we'll try to speed up through the lecture so that we're not sitting here all day just looking at slides and notes. Um, I know you guys want to see the live distillation process itself, and we will definitely get into that. Before I do, uh, I think it's always good when we have this class to kind of have an introduction discussion, just to kind of get to know each other a little more um, and a little bit more about each other's backgrounds. That helps me to understand each one of you uh, as an individual, where you're coming from in the industry. It helps me know whether or not you have any experience uh, with say things like extraction or even growing for that matter. Uh, David, let me confirm. Do you have another email address that you have associated with YouTube that you can log into? I'd be happy to send you another quick invite to the class um, and then you can try that. Just go ahead and send, uh, you can message it to me here, email it to me however you like, and I will send you another invite to uh, a different email if you have one for YouTube. Uh, but back to the introduction. Um, like I said, it's always good to know where people come from in this industry. Um, so my, let's just kind of, I'll ask the general question to the chat and feel free to just comment uh, down below. Does any of you have experience uh, with cannabis processing or cannabis extraction of any type, whether that be hydrocarbons, meaning butane or propane, or ethanol extraction using alcohols, or CO2 extraction, um, any, any sort of form of extraction. It could be even rosin or dry sift, water hash, whatever you guys prefer. Just um, chat in uh, the comment boxes. Let me know what your background is. This will kind of help me gauge um, where everybody is at. So it looks like uh, Ryan says that he is a butane, propane, and a water hash guy. John Ross says he grows and he preliminary makes hydrocarbon extracts. Okay, that's good, that's good. Two hydrocarbon guys in the class. We usually have a kind of a, an array of students um, that are from all sorts of backgrounds, including CO2. Uh, we get even guys that do like water hash and things like that. David, I just sent you another follow-up email to the new ad uh, email address you let me uh, know about in the chat. So check your email again. I just sent it out. Uh, but the reason I asked that question is because I, it's good to understand um, the the 
the background of everybody so that when it comes to distillation, I know what kind of topics to kind of touch on. So it sounds like most of everybody here is a hydrocarbon extractor, which in my eyes is uh, the best form of extraction. Um, you guys know that this is open source steel that is hosting this class. Um, and open source steel pr preliminary, uh, our main product is extraction for hydrocarbon equipment. So the butane and the propane extraction equipment. Uh, Christina, we have not started officially yet. We're just kind of opening discussions here. I'm just kind of letting you know, uh, or just kind of talking about backgrounds of extraction. We're just talking about, um, you know, what everybody's background in the industry is, whether or not you've done growing, or if you're just on the business side of things, or if you've done extracting, or anything. Now, the reason I ask this question again is also because Different extracts in the industry tend to leave to obviously different end products. Um, and those end products, to begin with, all have their own, um, I guess, cons and pros, you could say. And uh, during this class, we'll kind of talk about the different forms of extraction and why you might want to prefer one over the other. And especially when it comes to distillation, we're going to talk about why you might want to use butane extracts versus ethanol extracts or vice versa. So that's a topic we'll cover. But before we do, I also want to introduce myself personally. My name is uh, Josh DeLay and I will be your uh, presenter today for today's class and materials. Uh, I have one half of Open Source Steel. I'm the co-owner here. Uh, we've been a business in the cannabis space uh, for over three years, going on almost uh, three and a half years now. So we have a lot of experience uh, throughout the last three years, evolving through extraction, evolving through distillation, um, and also being a part of the feedback loop. So some people ask, what does the name open source steel exactly mean? What, what is that open source portion about? Well, myself, I'm a software de uh, developer originally, so I'm more of a technical-minded individual. Um, I really like to understand the details of, you know, software um, and hardware. So I'm a pretty nerdy person overall, and, uh, and that led me to becoming a software developer in what's called an open source space. Open source in the software space means uh, free and open ideas that are shared. Um, and created for the public to basically contribute to um, a project basically given away to the people to benefit uh, all individuals who are joining and participating in the project. Um, I feel that the cannabis space is, is a new industry that could most certainly benefit from an open source philosophy. We're all entering a market that has never existed before. There's a lot of new products. There's a lot of innovation and business happening. Um, and joining open source projects within the cannabis space are a great way uh, to get your, yourself involved in the industry, but also help evolve this industry. Um, so that's a little bit about myself. Um, I also have around two years of, maybe a little bit, almost three years of distillation experience. I've also been teaching the course here at Open Source Steel for around two years. Um, so we have, we have gone through this process quite a few times. Sorry about that, it looks like my mic muted. Uh, but as I was saying, we've, we've taught this class here at Open Source Steel uh, for around two years. I've been the instructor for a majority of that time. Looks like David is rejoining. David, are you there? Give me a chat. Yes. Um, and in that three or two years, uh, there's been a lot of evolution in the distillation process. So things today are definitely not the same as they were uh, two years ago. And we'll talk about some of those changes. But my, I, my, my main goal for today is to get you guys introduced to the process of distillation and also get you um, 
to feel really confident in understanding the variables that go into a distillation process so that when it comes to learning uh, and expanding upon the, the information and knowledge you received today, you guys will have that, you guys have that ability and experience to go out there and research further into this uh, process because there is a lot to learn. This is an evolving process. Uh, we're still early on in development of the uh, fastest and most efficient ways to make distillates. Now some of you guys uh, might be asking, um, okay John is asking me once you start the stream can you mute yourself here I was muting you but it keeps unmuting yes John I will um, right now I'm just kind of we're just doing a quick little introduction just letting you guys know who I am I wanted to just ask a couple questions um, if there's nobody that wants to participate in chat what I'll go ahead and do then is I will just mute myself here in Google that way you guys don't hear any doubling so from here on out, what I'm going to do is mute my microphone in the meeting here, and you guys can just listen through the live stream event. If at any time you need to chime in and ask questions, you can do so in the chat room here, or you can uh, chime in with your microphone, and I'll be able to hear you. All right, so enough about me. We'll go ahead and get into the live feed event today. We, like I said earlier, we have a lot of content to cover. I know you guys are excited to get going. Again, welcome. Uh, let's first start off and let's talk about distillation. First, what is distillation? Um, here you can kind of see a image of a basic simple distillation setup. Uh, essentially what we have here is we have heat at the bottom. This is uh, in the case of a Bunsen burner in this image. And we're just heating up uh, in this, this description or this pictogram is a water and ethanol solution. As it heats up, it creates vapor. That vapor is then condensed in a water condenser and collected in a receiving flask. In this case, uh, it looks like they are heating up some alcohol or ethanol and distilling it from water. And the output fraction here shows pure ethanol being captured. So the uh, actual description of distillation is a process of separating the component substances from a li liquid mixture by selective evaporation and condensation. Distillation may result in essentially complete separation of nearly pure components or it may be a partial separation and that it cre increases the concentration of a uh, selected component mixture. In either case, the process exploits the difference in volatilities of mixtures. Uh, Daniel Lieberman is saying, been trying for 1.5 hours and still can't log on to YouTube. Screen is just black. Is there anybody else having issues with seeing just a black screen on YouTube. Shouldn't have any issues at this point. I'm gonna try copying the pay or the link to the video here just for one time and see if that works for you. That doesn't work. Unfortunately, I'm not sure what's going on on your end. Uh, because it does appear to be fine on our end. I want to give you some time to help get that set up here, but we do have to continue going here today. We have a lot of content. Um, if you still have any issues, keep trying here, and then uh, we'll maybe try in another minute here. Uh, but again, the idea of distillation is that we want to separate component mixtures. Say in the instance of the previous slide, we had water and alcohol in a flask, and we're trying to separate the ethanol from uh, the water. Uh, it could be any sort of substance. It could be oil and water. Um, it could be two different types of, uh, of alcohols. It could be two different types of oil. It could be any sort of mixture that is put together. Ideally, the process of distillation, what we're trying to do is separate component mixtures. <clears throat> Ryan is saying his internet is not working at all. 240p. I have to try and drive to a coffee shop. 
Ryan, uh, that's okay. Uh, if you need to drive to a coffee shop, feel free. All of the slides for anybody who is uh, wondering, all of this information on these slides and presentation will be available to you after the class. So if you need to review it, um, feel free. I'd say the most critical portion to make sure that you catch today is the live uh, distillation demonstration, which we'll do here after the lecture. So you have some time to kind of figure things out. Um, I'll give you that time and I'll just continue on here. Now let's talk about some histories and origins of distillation. Uh, now distillation has been around forever. Uh, beginning evidence of distillation comes from Greek alchemists working in Alexandria in the first century AD. Notice that we've underlined the key term here, alchemists. Uh, we're not talking about scientists. We're talking about alchemy. Uh, we're talking about prior to the periodic table of elements. We're talking about people um, coming up with experiments and trying them out uh, and defining the periodic tables. Aristotle also wrote about his, this process of distillation in his Meteorologica, the book. And also, uh, in, in uh, six, uh, 1500, a German alchemist published uh, the book called the Libra de Arta de Distillandi. Uh, this is the book in the art of distillation. This is the first book solely dedicated to the subject of distillation, uh, which was later followed up by a uh, much more expanded version in 1512. So a little more than uh, a decade after the first distillation book, published in 1500, we see an expanded version. And now we see the French taking the Germans' uh, books of distillation in 1651, a little over 100 years later. We see John French, uh, he is, or excuse me, he's an English, uh, the first major English collection of information on the practice of distillation is produced. This includes diagrams with people in those diagrams and it shows the industrial scale rather than smaller benchtop scales of distillation. So this book expands again upon uh, the German alchemist's uh, book. They take the art of distillation, they create an English version of this practice, and then they put in their diagrams showing the scale of the distillation apparatuses by putting human images next to the diagrams to kind of give people an idea of the large scale of these uh, devices. Now we know a little bit about when distillation first started to appear and when we first started seeing documented published works of distillation in 1500. Now what are some of the origins of distillation apparatuses? Now as the alchemists started to evolve into science and uh, of chemistry, we started seeing vessels being created and these were called retorts. The first devices were called retorts used for distillation. And you can kind of see a, an image in the background here of a retort. Now both alembics and retorts are forms of glassware with a long neck, which point to the side and at a downward angle, which acted as an air-cooled condenser that would condense the distillate and let it drip downwards for collection. So here you're seeing two early uh, apparatuses used for distillation. The first one is the retort we talked about, which is on the right hand side. You can simply see that this is a bulbous flask style shape with a bent neck. It is very simple device. You put your liquid to be distilled or your mixture to be distilled inside the roundness of the flask. And you can see in this one there's a penny stopper or plug there to help put the liquid inside. It would be very difficult to feed it through the, the neck. And then the beak or the neck that hangs uh, to the side here and downward at an angle is simply an air-cooled condenser. Um, it has no jacket for water to help cool things down. Uh, it's just using the outside air temperature to help cool the vapors traveling through it to distill or collect the, the vapors into a condensate, which will end up as a distillate. On the output. The other uh, device is shown here is, is an alembic and this is similar to a retort except for alembics were commonly used on like for instance a bottle and in this instance here you can see this mushroom shaped cap like uh, shape and that mushroom shape 
was inserted on the top of a bottle. And in order to seal the bottle and the glass together, what they would commonly use is sometimes like dough or um, like a clay around the inside joint to help create a nice tight seal during the distillation. Now, early forms of distillation were what's called a batch processes, using one vaporization and one condensation cycle. Purity was improved further uh, distillation of the condensates. So greater volumes were processed by simply repeating over and over the distillation. And chemists were reportedly to carry out as many as 500 to 600 distillations in order to obtain a pure product. So what they're basically saying is they would take a batch distillation, which means, you know, like the image in the background here, you can kind of see we have one flask loaded with some liquid. It looks like water in this picture. And we have one receiving flask that will collect the output distillate. This is a simple batch distillation where we have one starting pot and we have one collection pot. It just, you, you basically have one shot on the output. It doesn't get to recycle over and over and over. And in order to cre create a higher purity, what they would then do, do is take the, the, the flask that is capturing the output distillate and they would redistill that again and again and again and again and again as many times as 500 to 600 times in order to obtain pure compounds. So this could have been done for some forms of oils or um, some forms of other liquid compounds. Uh, and those liquids were separated 500 to 600 times in order to obtain purity. Now the reason it was done so many times obviously is because they're using such crude uh, equipment. We're using retorts and alembics which are clearly very early apparatuses that don't have a lot of uh, engineering you could say going into them. They're simply a bent neck that is air cooled. Now, after early forms of distillation, uh, we start seeing in the 19th century the basics of modern techniques, including preheating, reflux, uh, which were developed particularly by the French. And in 1830, there was a British patent issued to Aeneas Coffee for a whiskey distillation column, uh, which worked continuously and may be regarded as the prototype uh, for modern petrochemical units. And you can see an image here of uh, Aeneas Coffee, or co coffee. And you can see the drawings of his er, early 1830 issued British patent here on the right, which was a whiskey distillation column. Now it looks a little bit more advanced, uh, and we'll cover some of this, uh, the, the, the variables that go into a distillation apparatus like this further on. But you can see as early as the 19th century in 1830, we have industrial scale, large size distillation patents being issued to the French. Now shortly after the French, we see the introduction of US patents by Ernest Solvay. Uh, he was granted his patent in 1877 for something that was issued as a tray column for ammonia distillation. Uh, not for whiskey distillation, but for ammonia, which is a common cleaning solvent um, and used in a number of processes. And during the same time in subsequent years, uh, we saw de developments of this theme that was used for ammonia and whiskeys for oil and for other spirits. So it was a slow evolution of some of the earlier patents that were issued to um, uh, Aeneas Coffee theme uh, around the world. It seems that the industrial scale distillation is becoming a, uh, a mainstay. Now early uh, in the 19th century we start seeing scientific rather than empirical methods that can be applied. Now that we have these patents and these devices um, they're coming up with theories such as refluxing and preheating which we'll talk about what those terms exactly mean here shortly. Um, but rather than these empirical methods, scientific uh, methods can now start to be applied. The development of the petroleum industry, like I said, the petrochemical industry, 
and the early 20th century also provided the growth and development for accurate designs and methods such as the McCabe Thiel or the Fenske equation, which uh, essentially are scientific equations to help come up with uh, the purity output of a distillate uh, given the component composition mixture. And the Fenske equation is also a mathematical equation uh, where it describes here in a couple of bulleted points, n equals the minimum number of theoretical plates required at total reflux, uh, of which the reboiler re is done, or excuse me, is one. And we'll talk about what theoretical plates are here soon, but we're just showing you here that in the 19th and 20th century, we're starting to see these real scientific uh, methods being applied to the, the process of distillation. There's no more empirical uh, methods just being applied. We're not just viewing, uh, you know, distillations with our two eyes and guessing what is coming out the output. We're actually starting to come up with uh, reproducible equations that we can rely on when it comes to distillation. Uh, continuing on, XD is the mole fraction of a more volatile comp uh, component in the overhead distillate. Xb is the mole fraction of a more volatile component in the bottom fraction or in the, in the bottom of the flask. A average is the average relative vol volatility of the more volatile component in the less volatile component. Now I know that sounds like a lot and we're going to kind of cover all of this. But my main point here in covering this kind of slide is to demonstrate that there are reliable equations that you can use uh, for uh, referencing distillation and that's the stuff you're going to want to research here as the cannabis industry evolves it's I would say that it's modern distillation which is allowing us to define these new equations for cannabis uh, but it's going to take a lot of uh, again scientific and empirical data to uh, get it to to go Christina is asking in the chat, I'm just going to go ahead and pop over here. Uh, Christina is asking, has the class on YouTube started? Yes, it has. We're just getting into it. We're only uh, about five or so slides in. Uh, but you should see everything on YouTube. I'm seeing it myself. Can everybody else confirm? Can everybody else confirm? I've checked myself, Christina, and I see it live. We're going to take a second here and make sure that everybody can see the content. Christina, I'm going to try and send you this link here in the chat. I'm not sure if it's going to work for you because this is a private stream, so you needed to be invited by your email address. So YouTube has sent you a direct link. I, I believe it's going to be a link only for you. Okay, there we go. Looks like it works. All right, so I'm going to mute myself in the chat here and we'll get back to uh, the slides. Again, uh, going back to the slide, my main point in covering this is to, to just to demonstrate that uh, from the 19th uh, century going forward, we're starting to see real development in the field of distillation. A lot of this, again, has to be contributed to uh, the petroleum industry. Obviously, oil is a huge factor in distillation or refinement uh, to make gas and other hydrocarbons. So we're starting to see these methods being developed for that. Now, what does that all mean for us? It just means that distillation and fractionalization Fractionalization are scientific methods with sound formulas that have been going on for thousands of years. This process is nothing new. Uh, distillation of cannabis oils is nothing new. Uh, products are distilled of all types of nature every day. Now, how can we apply distillation to the cannabis industry? Uh, what types of distillation do we have at our disposal? So there's really four main areas of distillation you can look at. 
The first and the most common is going to be laboratory, laboratory scale distillation. Obviously this is going to be uh, in most environments for processing. You're going to have technicians working in a laboratory environment, smaller bench top scale apparatuses, you know, something an individual can manage by themselves. Then once things get a little bit larger in scale and uh, we start to produce more out of a laboratory, it starts to make sense to go to more of an industrial scale. I'm sure you guys have seen industrial distillation towers at gas plants and things like that. Uh, that is a little bit outside the scope of today's class, but it is good to know that industrial scale distillation is available for us. Uh, the next thing is you're going to see it also applied in the cannabis industry, but the perfumery and the medicinal side of distillation, which is going to be a little bit uh, different from laboratory scale and that it's going to include herbal distillates. Um, we're going to be doing other plant material or organic material to derive terpenes and things like that, like oranges. Um, so there's a little bit of differences in the perfumery versus the laboratory scale. And then finally, we have like a food processing distillation. Uh, this can be used commonly in like the process of juices where they're taking uh, like orange juice and concentrating it down into a higher concentrate for use. So food processing distillation is used commonly in that as well. So great, now we learned something today. We learned a little bit about the origins of distillation. Uh, we learned about who started creating some of the first patents of distillation and books around distillation. Uh, we also learned a little bit about the different forms of distillation. Now let's find out exactly how does this process work? What is it that uh, causes distillation to be you know, so cool? Well, the first key point to distillation obviously is gonna be boiling points. Now the definition of a boiling point is the boiling point of a liquid varies depending upon the surrounding environmental pressure. A liquid in a partial vacuum has a lower boiling point than when a liquid is at atmospheric pressure. Now that means also for a given pressure, different liquids are going to boil at different temperatures. Now what exactly does all that mean? Well, the best example I can give you guys is to think about water boiling. And that is what we have shown in the image next to this paragraph, is a teapot with water boiling in it. Now, I want to talk about the first sentence here says the boiling point of a liquid varies depending upon the surrounding environmental pressures. If you're not aware, the environment around us every day has a, is exerting an, uh, a pressure on our outside body. And that rough estimate at sea level for the pressure or the amount of force exerted on a human body at sea level is roughly 14.7 pounds per square inch. Now that's going to change depending on where you're at. If you are at sea level, obviously it's 14.7. But if you start going to the top of Mount Everest, the pressure exerted on your body is going to be reduced. That's because the atmosphere and the molecules in the atmosphere are not as much. You're, you're going higher into the atmosphere or higher into the sky and that is removing the pressure being exerted on your body. Now, uh, the same thing of pressure also changes boiling points. And uh, we'll talk about the difference in elevation for boiling points here shortly. I think it might be on the next slide. It is. So the next slide here is going to, uh, is going to talk about the normal boiling point. Now, what is the normal boiling point? It is also called the atmospheric boiling point or the atmospheric pressure boiling point of a liquid uh, is the special case in which the vapor pressure of the liquid equals the defined atmospheric pressure at sea level of one atmosphere. Uh, David is asking, do I need YouTube premium to view? David, you do not need YouTube premium, you just need any YouTube in order to watch, go ahead and try and click that link again. You need to be signed in to an email address that is associated with your order. I know you sent me another email, I put both of them in there. 
you can only use those emails to view this class. Uh, the normal boiling point is touch again back on this. Now, it says in here one atmosphere, and we're going to talk a lot about atmospheres or PSI or micron or mmHg or millimeters or inches of mercury, which is mg. Now, all of these different tor, micron, PSI, all these are just different pressure readings, okay? They're all the same. Uh, they're, they're all reading the same type of measurement. They're reading pressure. It's just they all each have their own scale at reading pressure. And what they're defining here as the normal boiling point is, the, is of course, at one atmosphere, which means sea level. So when you're at sea level, you're basically at one. One atmosphere, or one atmosphere also equals 14.7 PSI. So that, that pressure that's exerted by the atmosphere around you, all the, all the molecules in the air uh, exerting force down on your body, that's equal to one atmosphere or 14.7 PSI. And the normal boiling point defines the, uh, the pressure or the, 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 the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid equals the surrounding pressure. So in the case of boiling water, We'll talk about the normal boiling point and what does that mean. If you put water on the stove and you begin to boil water and you must be around sea level, the temperature at which that water will begin to boil is roughly 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, that temperature will begin to uh, agitate and move the molecules of the water to the point where there'll be enough energy and exerted force within the water to match or equal the atmospheric pressure surrounding it. So for water at sea level boiling, when it hits 212 degrees, it is exerting 14.7 degrees of uh, vapor pressure, which is the same exact pressure that is exerted by the sea level atmosphere. And so that's why water begins to boil. And you can also kind of another analogy is to think about going to the gym and lifting and doing a bench press. I'm sure everybody has done a bench press. And uh, just a second here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer David. David, it, it, I'm not sure what's going on on your end, but you must, again, you must use the email address associated with your order. I put the two in there. I don't know if anybody else is having an issue. It doesn't look like it. It looks like you're isolated with the issue. Maybe try restarting your computer or trying a different browser. Perhaps it's your browser. And if you finally have one more email address that you'd like me to try, put it in chat. I can try it again. But I got to get back to the class. Uh, we, again, we have a lot of stuff to cover, and I want to make sure that everybody um, has a chance to get to that information. Okay, so again, 212 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature at sea level at which water will exert 14.7 psi, or the, the, it will match the surrounding pressure, and that is what will cause the vapor to leave the liquid. It will start to form into a vapor, and it will, have, it will start to exert more pressure than the atmosphere, and that's where you will start to see vaporizing happen. Uh, and again, so this, this statement says, at that, vapor, at that temperature, the vapor pressure of the liquid becomes sufficient to overcome atmospheric pressure and allow bubbles of vapor to form inside the bulk of the liquid. Now, the standard, the standard boiling point has been identified by something called the IUPAC since 1982 as the temperature at which boiling occurs under a pressure of one bar. Again, one bar, one atmosphere, 14.7 PSI. These are all different units of measurement. Okay. So there's differences in boiling point versus normal boiling point. And that's why I've defined normal boiling point and boiling point together. The boiling point is going to be at sea level, or excuse me, the normal boiling point is what, it, what 
a substance's boiling point is at sea level. Because as you change elevation, things are going to change in boiling points. Now it says here, the boiling point corresponds to the temperature at which vapor pressure of the liquid equals the surrounding environmental pressure, which we just mentioned before. Thus, the boiling point is dependent on the pressure. Now, I'm going to give you guys another analogy here. It's like going to the gym and doing a bench press on the bench, right? Let's just use an even number of 100 pounds on the bar, and we're going to do a bench press. Now, if you're a you know, relatively strong individual, you should be able to bench press that 100 pounds. Now, that is what would be considered the boiling point. If you can lift that bar off, off up and off the, off the stand, that means that you're hitting enough force or you're, you're exerting over 100 pounds of force in order to lift the bar. So that's where boiling begins. It's the same kind, of pro, same kind of principle. If you exert enough force, you will exceed the surrounding atmospheric pressure and boiling will begin. Now, we can also reduce the amount of pressure exerted on the bar. And in the case of the gym example or the bench press, you can always remove weight from the bar to make lifting the bar easier. And that same kind of idea applies to atmospheric pressure. If there is roughly 14.7 PSI of pressure exerted on the human at sea level, if we can reduce that to half that pressure of say 7.5, uh, you know, just say average, that will mean that it's much easier to boil. It means that we don't need as much pressure to boil. Or in the case of the, of the uh, bench press, we don't need to force as much energy to lift the bar off of the rack because we've removed the amount of weight. So these simple principles can apply to distillation as well. Now, boiling points are published with respect to the NIST, uh, which is the National Inter Institute of Standards and Technology, I believe. And they define the USA standard pressure of 101.325 kilopascals. And this is also equal to one atmosphere, or again, that number of 14.7 PSI. So all of these, all of these uh, different units of measurement, whether it's 101.325 kilopascals, or one atmosphere, or 14.7 PSI, are all the reference of standard pressure at sea level. And that means that all substances, all liquid substances, or all solid substances, their boiling points are referred to based on sea level. So we try to reference everything and its boiling point from sea level because that is our best gauge, you know, sea level. Everybody has sea level uh, or can uh, reference a sea level location. So referencing boiling points at sea level will give you a standardized boiling point for all substances. And from there, you can, um, you can do calculations to reduce the pressure and to see what the change in, uh, in, in boiling point will be. Now, at higher elevations where the atmospheric pressure is much lower, the boiling point is also going to be lower. The boiling point increases with increased pressure up to what's called the critical point where the gas and the liquid properties become identical. Now the boiling point cannot be increased beyond the critical point. And likewise, the boiling point decreases with decreased pressure until what's called a triple point is reached. Now the boiling point cannot be reduced beyond the triple point. And all of this is only going to be produced in a vacuum environment. Now I know that's kind of a lot of information. It's a little confusing. Uh, but the idea is that if we can remove pressure, say by going to the top of Mount Everest, right? 
you're high up in elevation. You're further up in the sky, which means there's less atmospheric molecules exerting force down on your body. It means that the pressure exerted on your body is less. There's less force exerted, which also means the boiling points are going to be reduced. They're going to be lower. Just like in the case of going to the gym, if you lower the weight on the bar, the amount of force that you need to lift that bar is going to be reduced. It makes it easier. It means you need less energy. It means your workout's going to be easier for you. And in the case of distillation, we're always trying to reduce the work or effort in distillation. Now, on the opposite end of spe the spectrum, if you go underneath the sea in a submarine, force is again increased from 14.7 psi and you're going to see dramatic increases in pressure because now you're going underwater you're going below sea level below sea level is going to cause molecules of water around you which is going to cause extreme amount of force and is going to increase boiling points so there's both available options when it comes to temperature and pressure they're related together and that's one of the key points to take away from this slide is that pressure and temperature are related David I'm not sure again why you're having issues with the stream uh, if you want again like I said sign out sign back in or use a different browser um, I'm not sure if it's the email address that you're trying to use or what. Shouldn't be having any issues at this point. I'm fortunate that you are having those issues, but I do believe it is only on your side at this time. Okay, so continuing on. Now, if we know that sea level is used as the reference for all boiling points, well then, we can use a boiling point as a reference for the property of a pure compound. Now, a given pure component or compound has only one normal boiling point. If any, and a compound's normal boiling point and melting point can serve as characteristic or physical properties for that compound, it's listed in reference books. Okay? So what I mean here is that water is only ever going to boil at 212 degrees at sea level. Pure water, that is. Now, salt water or maybe muddy water or an impure solution of water is obviously going to boil at different temperatures. And that's what this slide is getting across, is that we're using boiling points as a reference point for the purity of a substance. So if we're at sea level, if we know we're at atmospheric pressure, and we have a liquid mixture inside of, say, a pot on a stove, and we don't know what the mixture is or what the solution of liquid is, we can use the boiling point that we measure. If we put a thermometer in the pot and we start to see it boil, and we record the temperature as 212 degrees Fahrenheit, well, we can also use reference books, and that's what this also states, is that you can look at, the physical properties of a compound in reference books. So we can look up, you know, we could go to Wikipedia or we could go to the periodic table of elements or we could look up an engineering handbook and we can find the boiling point for the MSDS sheet, material, material safety data sheet for a, um, uh, a solvent or anything we use in liquid form. We can tell the boiling point of it or guess, the boil or guess the substance based on the boiling point. So if I put my thermometer in the water and it begins to boil at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, well, that's going to limit the amount of, of substances that could be, right? Boil boiling at 212 degrees is only, you know, such so many substances. And from there, uh, we can do further tests um, in order to identify the purity or what the compound is. Now, it's important to note that some compounds decompose at higher temperatures before reaching their normal boiling point, or sometimes even their melting point. For a stable compound, the boiling point will range from its triple point to 
its critical point, and that deter uh, is depending on the ex external pressures that are being forced on it. Uh, so it's important to note that compounds, some compounds, or liquid mixtures, at higher temperatures, even before reaching boiling, so if you put you know, a, a pot of water on the stove, some, some solutions, before they're actually boiling, will start to de decompose. And now, I put this slide in here because it's important to note that cannabis, in particular, is going to be something that has a high chance of decomposing, right? There's going to be compounds inside of the mixture of, can of cannabis that start to decompose if you apply too much heat. Those can be terpenes, and those also can be cannabinoids. And we'll talk about some of the uh, decomposition or some of the isomerization you might see happen because of heat. Okay, so I wanted to note here in this slide that some compounds will actually begin to decompose before they begin to boil, or in some cases before they even melt from their solid phase. And that's also uh, having to do with cannabis. Terpenes will start to evaporate, they will start to degrade even before they melt or as soon as they start melting. Even before they boil or evaporate. And as soon as they start melting, as soon as any heat is started to apply to it, they start to degrade and uh, decompose. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about boiling points, let's talk about evaporation. Now, liquids may change to a vapor at temperatures below their boiling points through a process of evaporation. Evaporation is a surface phenomenon in which molecules located near the liquid's edge, not contained by enough liquid pressure on that side, to escape into the surroundings as a vapor. Now, on the other hand, boiling is a process in which molecules anywhere in the liquid escape, resulting in the formation of vapor bubbles within the liquid. There's, distinguish, uh, there's dis distinguishing features between evaporation and boiling. And so when you see today's demonstration, you'll start to notice evaporation and boiling separate. Now, evaporation starts to happen even before boiling. You'll set, a, you'll set up, I always use the pot of water because it's the easiest to reference for everybody. If you put a pot of water on the stove, before it starts to hit 212 degrees, where it actually starts to roll and boil, you will, you'll see, even before 212 degrees Fahrenheit, steam starting to generate from the top of the surface of the liquid. I'm not talking about when the liquid is boiling, where there's bubbles from the bottom of the pot or within the liquid forming. I'm talking before bubbles start to actually form, you will see uh, evaporation start to happen. Now, once we have evaporation, um, that's when basically, obviously, the, the, we talked about boiling points and exerting pressure. Well, once the boiling begins to happen or vaporization begins to happen, that's when we start generating force. We're starting to generate pressure. And this is called vapor pressure. And you'll see it. Uh, shown in this picture here where we have two flasks capped off and you see the molecules inside the flask starting to leave the water or leave the liquid mixture and evaporate into the container and since this can container is capped or this this flask or beaker is capped it is starting to exert pressure within the environment so the vapor uh, pressure, again, is the substance uh, uh, or the pressure of a substance. The pressure at which gas phase is in equilib equilibrium with its condensed phase, liquid or solid. It is a measurement of the tendency of molecules and atoms to escape from a liquid or solid. Okay, so it's telling you that it has to be um, in equilibrium with its condensed phase. I'm sorry, yeah, with its uh, liquid condensed phase. And you'll start to see that pressure exerted at the equilibrium of the liquid and the vapor. 
Now, how do we get to this point? Obviously, this is this this slide should look like third grade to you guys, um, but it is important to to you know re readdress that there is three key points when it comes to thermal energy transfer. How are we going to achieve evaporation? How are we going to achieve boiling? And that's through thermal energy transfer. Now, everything in life is just a matter of energy transfer, whether it's hot to cold or cold to hot. Energy always exists. It doesn't, it doesn't get used up. It doesn't go away. Energy is strictly transferred from one to another. So in the case of this image on the screen, you're seeing a pot on the stove of water. The radiation or the waves, uh, particles are coming from the heating element on the stove. Those are conducted through the metal. Those waves are conducted into the metal. And once that conduction starts happening, molecules within the water start to move around. They get excited. The radiation starts to conduct and excite the molecules in the water. And then what starts happening is as the molecules start moving, they start moving around, and this is called convection. And then once you start getting convection to happen, that's when molecules start to reach towards the surface, and molecules can start to move around fast enough at the surface of the liquid to the point where they can escape. This escaping is called latent heat. This is the amount of energy or heat that is latent. Uh, it is just evaporating off the surface throughout this thermal energy transfer. So there's three key points. It's radiation, conduction, and convection, which all lead to latent heat or thermal energy transfer. Now, thermal energy is energy that comes from heat. This heat is generated by the movement of tiny particles within an object. And the faster these particles move, the more heat is generated. It's as simple as that. Now, a couple of other key terms I want to cover here is once we have thermal energy applied, we're going to start seeing saturation of energy or liquid. And this first term is called a saturated liquid. It contains as much thermal energy as it can without boiling. So when, when the molecules of water start getting really excited by being put on the stove, they start to con uh, convect and start moving around. Now, a saturated liquid is when all of that heat enters into the water, and the water is not yet boiling, but is just prior to boiling. That means it is saturated, a saturated liquid. It means it's saturated full of energy. Now, conversely, on the opposite end, a saturated vapor contains as little thermal energy as it can without condensing. So, once you get from a saturated liquid and things start to boil, you start to create a, what's called a saturated vapor. Now, you only want to apply as much heat as necessary to keep a saturated vapor in a vapor state. You don't want to apply too much energy because it's not needed. It can decompose and break down, cause other problems. But you only want to apply as much heat as necessary in order to keep it in a vapor state without condensing. This is kind of like helium in a balloon, right? You only want to apply enough energy to keep the balloon in the air. If you apply too little energy, the balloon will start to fall back down towards the ground. This is, can be used in the same kind of sense of heat. You only want to apply enough heat to keep the molecules in a vapor floating in the air, not too much heat to the point where you can degrade them or decompose them. Now, a saturation temperature means a boiling point. So once we've reached a uh, saturated uh, liquid, we can reach the saturated temperature. That means we're actually boiling. That means we've sufficiently reached enough thermal energy in order to begin boiling. It means our liquid is saturated enough to the point where uh, we don't need to apply any more energy to keep it boiling. And that's the reference is called the saturation temperature. And it is also correlated to what's called a saturation pressure. Saturation pressure and temperature are uh, basically used together. So once you've reached saturated temperature, 
you can also measure saturated pressures. The liquid can be said to be saturated with thermal energy, and any additional of, of thermal energy results in a phase transition. So from the liquid to a vapor state, in this case, the saturated temperature. Uh, again, saturated pressure is the pressure for the corresponding saturation temperature at which a liquid will boil into its vapor phase. Saturation pressure and saturation temperature have a direct relationship. As saturation pressure increases, so does saturation temperature. Now, it's, these are all key terms to kind of re recall because as you get into distillation and as you start to monitor temperatures, you'll start to understand at what point you're becoming saturated with energy and at which point you might be applying too much. Now, if we get to a, uh, say, a boiling point or if we get to a point at which the system is um, evaporating and the temperature remains constant, this is called an isothermal system. Now, vapor at saturation, pressure, and temperatures will begin to condense into its liquid phase as the system pressure is increased. Because as we increase the pressure, it's just like, it's, it's like taking air out of the balloon, right? We're increasing the pressure or like putting more weight on the bar at the gym. As we increase the pressure or weight, also the temperature is going to increase for boiling or also the amount of energy needed to lift the bar is going to increase. Uh, and then similarly, a liquid at saturated pressure and temperatures will tend to flash into its vapor phase as system pressure is decreased. So once we get to a saturated uh, pressure or temperature, and if we remove pressure from the system, it will begin to flash into a vapor because it's like removing weight off the bar. It's gonna make things easier to get into a vapor state. These are really key things to understand here is that how pressure and temperature are correlated together. As we remove pressure, temperature is decreased, or vice versa, as we reduce temperature, pressure is decreased, or as we increase pressure, temperature increases, or vice versa, as we increase temperature, or I mean, as we increase pressure, temperature increases. So these are boiling points. All these have to do with their relationship together. And what does all that mean? It means we have thermodynamic control. It means we have control of the variables in our system. And uh, that's important. Now let's, let's kind of hash back on the example of water. And I want to give you more examples to kind of hit hone or hit home on this idea of boiling points and pressure. And the example here is water at atmospheric pressure. Now, there are two conventions regarding the stand, standard boiling point of water. The normal boiling point um, in a metric system is going to be 99.97 degrees Celsius. In empirical, we're looking at 211.9 degrees Fahrenheit. That's why I've been just kind of rounding up to 212. But water boils at 99.7 C, or what's 211.9 F, at pressure of one atmosphere, which means at sea level, or one atmosphere equals 101.325 kilopascals. Now the IUPAC, which is another, uh, another standardizing body, they recommend the standard boiling point of water at a standard pressure of 100 kilopascals. Okay? Uh, there's two conventions. There's the IUPAC and there is the um, uh, Standards Institute for um, Standards. The, the, uh, they will reference it at 100 kilopascal. So they just round down the number a little bit to try to make things even. You know, the empirical, I mean, the uh, metric system, they like to round things a little bit. That also makes it one bar even which actually lowers the reference boiling point to 211.3 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's important to determine which convention you're, you're looking at when referencing boiling points. Um, one is referenced at 101.325 kilopascals and the other is at 100 even. 
So let's see. Now, on the top of Mount Everest is a good example. Once we elevate up to the higher mountain and we get high as 29,000 feet in elevation, the pressure reduces. Now, we're, we're not having as many atmospheric molecules exerted on our body, so it's actually reduced from around 100 kilopascals to around one-third of the weight. So it's only around 34 kilopascals, also referenced here in TOR, which is another unit of measurement, which 255 TOR. And the boiling point of water at Mount Everest is going to be reduced because the amount of pressure is reduced. And now water is going to boil now at 71 degrees Celsius, or only 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're going to see a dramatic decrease in the amount of temperature due to the pressure difference at Mount Everest. Because we're so high in elevation, the pressure is reduced that the boiling point is going to be reduced. Okay, And that's important. I will, I'll say that's important because earlier I mentioned to you guys that things can decompose before their normal boiling point. So in order to remove or to mitigate decomposition or degradation of a product, if we can remove the pressure, we can remove or, or lower the temperature at which we have to distill, which is important. Um, in the case of ethanol or alcohol, we can basically distill ethanol at almost room temperatures by doing it under vacuum or reducing the pressure. So we'll, we'll further talk about that in relation to cannabis as we continue. Now elements uh, here, there's a couple of elements. Just to give you an idea of some of the, with the lowest and the highest boiling points, helium has a low boiling point of 452 degrees negative. So it wants to boil at negative 452, which is crazy. It's like water boils at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. This boils at negative degrees. It's the lowest boiling point. And the highest boiling point is rhenium or tungsten, which exceeds 5,000 degrees Kelvin, <coughs> excuse me, 31 degrees Fahrenheit at standard pressures. Rhenium and tungsten are commonly used for welding because they won't melt. They'll arc and they will melt other metals, but they don't melt themselves. The boiling point uh, is actually a reference. It's not really exact because they, they have a hard time measuring the highest boiling points and the lowest boiling points. Now, what's the relationship between the normal boiling points and the vapor pressure of a liquid? Well, the higher the vapor pressure of a liquid, at a given temperature, the lower the normal boiling point. So in the case of, let's go back a slide, helium. Helium in a canister has a very high pressure. When you buy helium from the store, it has a lot of pressure in that canister. And the reason it has a lot of pressure is because the liquid inside the canister wants to boil at negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So putting that liquid in, say, room temperatures at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, well, 70 degrees Fahrenheit is far exceeding the boiling point. It means that that liquid wants to, it wants to flash into a, a gas. It wants to turn into an immediate vapor. It wants to roll into a boil and make a big old cloud if it wasn't trapped inside that canister. That is, that is the relationship between vapor pressure and boiling point. The higher the vapor pressure, the lower the normal boiling point. So if you look at a canister of argon for welding or for other uses, you look at the bottle and it has 2,000 PSI on there, you know the boiling point of that mixture or that substance has to be very low because at room temperatures, obviously, it's, it wants to boil. I hope that makes sense to everybody. And here is that chart that kind of shows you the relationship of the boiling point and the temperatures. So for you guys that do hydrocarbon extraction, you can look at the bright green butane line. And if we look right in the middle, we see at one atmosphere or vapor pressure, you can see right at one. If we go to the dot right on the line one and we go over to butane, we're going to see a dot right 
around zero degrees Celsius as the boiling point for butane. It is a little bit higher than zero degrees Celsius. It's maybe one degree Celsius or so. But that means that the boiling point for butane is zero degrees Celsius. It means that room temperature butane wants to boil. If we take it below zero degrees Celsius, say we put butane in a walk-in freezer at negative 10 degrees Celsius, well, butane does not want to boil then, and the pressure in that canister will actually reduce because we're reducing the temperature. So these are how they're related to vapor pressure and boiling points. Now, if we know boiling points are a reference for purity, say we've been given a jug of water from the store and we pour it into a pot and we measure the temperature at which it boils at one atmosphere, we can use its boiling point as a reference for purity as we stated earlier. So if it boils higher than expected, say water, you have water from the store and it starts to boil at 220 degrees Fahrenheit instead of 212 degrees Fahrenheit, what that means is that we must have some sort of impurity in the mixture. Or it is a different substance altogether from water because we would expect water to boil at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And since it's boiling higher than that, we would have to, it would be safe to assume that it is a different mixture besides pure water. It has to be something else. So we can use that boiling point uh, as a reference for impurities in the mixture. And the presence of non-volatiles, so meaning you know something that's not gonna boil, such as salts or compounds of a volatility far lower than the main component compound will decrease its mole fraction and the solution's volatility overall. And thus, it will raise the normal boiling point elevation. As a common example, like I said earlier, Salt water is going to boil at a higher temperature than just pure water. And the reason that is, is because the mixture or the ratio of water to salt is causing the boiling point to increase because you have a non-volatile, meaning it doesn't want to evaporate easily uh, or has a higher boiling point. You have a, a higher boiling point substance inside of your component mixture with water and so the higher boiling point impurity will cause elevation in temperatures. Now this is very important and critical when it comes to cannabis distillation and we'll talk about this during winterization and impurities in your extract because we all know that an extract whether it's butane, CO2, ethanol, rosin, they're all going to have impurities of some type in them it's just a matter of how much impurities and how much impurities will, more impurities is obviously going to affect your temperatures more. It'll mean you have to go higher in temperature in order to distill. And higher in temperature means you're going to degrade more product over time. So we're always trying to reduce the temperature we need to apply to distillation. So impurities, we want to remove all the impurities possible and we want to reduce the pressure as much as possible to help lower the boiling points. Uh, so here's an example showing you a liquid vapor composition chart. Uh, it shows the boiling points of two mixtures. It shows a boiling point of a pure compound A and the boiling point of a pure compound B. It discusses mole fractions here. If you look at the bottom uh, horizontal axis, it goes from zero to 100% of component B to on the right side, 100% of A and 0% B. I know it's a little bit hard to follow along, but essentially this is going to show you at which phase during the, uh, you're going to see, it's basically a, uh, a liquid vapor composition of your component mixture. It's gonna show you at what temperature you will start to see vapors vaporizing in those mixtures. And it will also show you at which point there will be a mixture. It'll show you what the mixture will roughly be, whether it's 
or 100% of component B and none of A, or vice versa. So this will help you determine the output ratio of your fraction depending on boiling points of your mixture. So this is more scientific methods that can be applied to distillation when it comes to creating a liquid vapor composition chart for your component mixtures. Now this kind of chart is a little more difficult to apply to our industry because the botanical industry in general is dealing with nature and nature or plants, they don't always reproduce the exact same composition every time. You're going to have a little difference in uh, impurities from batch to batch. So determining the exact, exact ratio of uh, products is not going to be uh, as easy. David, I'm going to try your email here. Um, just give me just a second. I'm going to try and invite David again. All right, David. All right, David, check your email. I just sent you another invite to the class. Um, hopefully, you don't have any issues with that one. Um, so again, this chart, just showing you uh, the liquid vapor composition, but like I was saying, it makes it difficult in cannabis or in the botanical industry to really apply this kind of chart uh, because we don't always know the exact component mixture of the substance. There may be a higher percentage of terpenes or other cannabinoids within the compound mixture. So you might have a higher ratio of CBN or CBD or THC versus uh, another. You might have more fats or waxes or lipids in there. You might also see chlorophyll or plant material. Um, it could be a number of reasons why you have impurities in your solution. Could be due to water and alcohol. Um, so it's a little difficult to judge the exact mixture um, starting out. This would be easier to judge if we knew the starting mixtures uh, compounds or fractions. Okay, continuing on. Now we looked at the relationships between vapor pressure and boiling points, um, but let's look at this to do with temperature also. So uh, again, here's the butane chart. You see the vapor pressure at one, so the temperature at around one degree Celsius just under one degree Celsius. And again, the higher the vapor pressure of a liquid at a given temperature, the higher the volatility and the lower the normal boiling point. It's a, it's a simple one sentence phrase here, but reading that back has a lot of packed information in that one sentence. It states again, I'm gonna read it back slowly. The higher the vapor pressure, so for example, if you have a helium can canister, higher, you know, if you have a really high bottle of pressure, or the gauge on there is really high pressure of a liquid at a given temperature, so say at room temperature, the higher that pressure is, it means the higher the volatility and the lower the boiling point. So in the case of helium, it was like negative 430 degrees was the boiling point. It means it has a really, really low boiling point, negative 400. Negative 400 boiling point means it's going to have a high vapor pressure. It means a lot of pressure at room temperature. And that means it's a very volatile, very volatile gas, very volatile mixture of liquid. And the opposite is true. So if it doesn't have a high pressure, so say you have a canister of water. Say you put fill a jug or a closed container full of water, it's not going to have any real vapor pressure. That's because at room temperature, water doesn't want to boil. That means it has a low volatility. Water is not volatile. Water is not wanted to flash into a gas or a vapor at you know, room temperatures. So it is not volatile. But other things like butane or CO2 or helium, nitrogen, those are all volatile gases. They're very volatile. Now volatility ahead. Uh, now we talked about volatility. Let's give you the exact definition of what volatility means. Now in chemistry and in physics, volatility is the tendency of a substance to vaporize. 
Now, volati volatility is direct directly related to a substance's vapor pressure, right? We talked about that in the case of helium. At a given temperature, a substance with higher vapor pressure vaporizes more readily than a substance with low vapor, vapor pressure. In the case of water, water doesn't want to boil crazy. It doesn't have a high vapor pressure. This term is preliminary uh, written to be applied to liquids, mainly liquids. However, it may be used to describe the process of something called sublimation, which is associated with sol solid substances such as dry ice or solid carbon dioxide, which is dry ice. Um, it can change directly from the solid state to a vapor state without actually becoming liquid. You guys see this when you take dry ice and you put it into the environment. It starts to kind of smoke. It goes from a solid ice to a gas immediately. It doesn't have any opportunity to go into a liquid state. That's because liquid or solid car or excuse me, solid carbon dioxide, pressed carbon dioxide, dry ice is extremely volatile. At room temperatures, it just wants to turn into a gas. So that's why it doesn't even go into a liquid state. And that process of going from a solid to a gas directly is called sublimation. David, you having any luck now getting into the video? So um, after volatility, we talk about evaporation. Uh, obviously, evaporation is a type of vaporization of liquid that occurs from the surface of a liquid into the gas phase that is not saturated uh, with the evaporating substance. So it only happens at the surface. David, I sent you an invite. I'm going to paste the link again. Um, you, could, you can also just click on this link, but you need to make sure that you are signed in. Check your spam as well. I believe that email address was the first one associated with your order. So I already sent you that email. I'm going to take it off again and do another one. David. All right, try it again. I sent you another email, David. Um, okay, so uh, back to the evaporation. It happens from the surface of a liquid into the gas phase that is not saturated with the evaporating substance. So evaporation, again, only happens at the surface. It doesn't happen from within the liquid. So if somebody says, oh, look, that water is evaporating, and you see it boiling, there's evaporation happening at the surface, but boiling is not evaporation. The other type of vaporization is boiling which is characterized by bubbles of saturated vapor forming in the liquid phase. Um, so steam is also produced in a boiler is another example of evaporation occurring in a saturated vapor phase. Now, evaporation that occurs directly from the solid phase below the melting point, again, is commonly observed with ice, uh, or with moth crystals, or with uh, CO2, and again, that's called sublimation. Now, once we have this evaporation happening, there's an important process that happens, and that is called evaporative theory. I'm going to read this uh, description here and kind of give you guys an example to help go along with it. But on average, a fraction of the molecules in a glass of water have enough heat energy to escape from the liquid. Water molecules from the air are entering into the glass, but as long as the relative humidity of the air is that it's in contact with is less than 100% saturated, the net transfer of water molecules are gonna be into the air. So from the glass into the air, water is going to evaporate as long as there's not 100% humidity. 100% humidity would mean it's raining or it's you know very muggy outside and water would not have the ability to evaporate into the air. It's 100%. Um, the water in the glass is going to be cooled by that evaporation until an equilibrium is reached where the air supplies the amount of heat 
removed by the evaporating water. In enclosed environments, the water would evaporate until the air is fully saturated. So you guys have seen this happen. Uh, as a kid, you maybe done this experiment where you take a glass of water and you set it on the counter, and over a week you come back and the water is no longer in the glass. <coughs> That's because um, the outside temperature of the air surrounding the glass is actually penetrating the water molecules. That heat is exciting those water, water molecules, which is causing them to um, conduct and conve convect energy. And as the convection starts happening, the water molecules start moving around and get to the surface and start evaporating into the surrounding environment. Right? And as that, as that evaporation is leaving, or as the water is leaving the glass, it's also taking that heat with it. So it's just like sweating. This is another example is when you're working out and you begin to sweat. The reason you sweat is because your body is trying to evaporate the moisture out of your body so that your body begins to cool. Basically, you're trying to expel heat through sweat out of your body. The heat is actually leaving. So that's why you begin to cool down as you sweat. Your body is, is, is acting as a natural refrigerator. It's causing it to evaporate, and that evaporation causes cooling to happen at the surface of your skin because the water and the heat is leaving through evaporation. And once you reach this point, you'll reach an equilibrium. So this is why water boils at 212 degrees. No matter how hot you put underneath it, you could put a thousand degree flame underneath uh, water. But as it begins to evaporate, what's happening with the vapor is the heat is leaving at the same amount of pace that, the, that its heat is being applied. So the liquid is actually constantly cooling itself. It's constantly trying to maintain an equilibrium at the boiling point of 212 degrees Fahrenheit with water at, at atmospheric temperature, pressure. So it's actually cooling down the water as you evaporate, and this is how refrigerators work and ACs work. Obviously, water is an essential part of our, um, uh, our, our watershed system. Um, Continue on. Now there's three key pieces to evaporation, and those are heat. Obviously, we need heat to apply and create um, energy in order to excite molecules. The outside surrounding atmospheric pressure also is key to evaporation. If we have too much pressure on the outside, it's going to cause it to increase our boiling points, meaning more difficult to evaporate. And the next thing is going to be air movement or the surrounding environment's saturation of the evaporating compound mixture. So, for example, if you're in a bubble and it's 100% humidity, well, water can't evaporate into the surrounding air because the water is already 100% saturated with water. So, fresh air movement or air movement in general is going to move fresh air into the equation. It's going to remove saturated uh, environment and the air movement is going to cause the rate of evapor evaporation to increase. Now, we talked about water evaporating and volatile mixtures evaporating, but what about oils? Liquids that do not evaporate visibly at a given temperature in a, ge in a given gas, for example, like cooking oil at room temperatures, they have molecules that don't tend to transfer energy in a way or a pattern that really gives them the necessary energy to like get them to the top and turn them into a vapor. However, these liquids are evaporating. It's just that those, the energy moving is so slow. The molecules are so heavy that it takes quite a lot of heat to excite them and move them around. That even though you visually don't see evaporation happening, it is still occurring. Um, and you'll see it you know, in your, your, your cabinets for your veggie oil, your cooking oil, sometimes you'll start to see it actually crystallize or start to turn around the top threading around the cap. It's because it's evaporating in the jug. So even though you may not see evaporation happening, it does occur even in heavy oils uh, and heavier molecules. Now, we've been talking about 
evaporation or we've been talking about uh, the process of, of distilling or, or vapor in a atmospheric type environment, meaning, you know, in your current room or environment. But what if we can enclose this process inside of, say, a bubble or in a mini dome or an environment? Essentially, that's what we do when we put all of this in glassware. We're creating our own environment where we can control the pressure and we can control the temperatures. So now, if evaporation takes place in an enclosed area, such as I described in glassware or in a dome or a controlled environment of some sort, the escaping molecules are going to accumulate in that environment above the liquid. So if you have it inside of, a, say, a beaker or a jug, if you heat it up, vapor is going to form like a cloud or a bubble inside that container. Now, many of the molecules are going to return back to the liquid. Uh, with the returning molecules becoming more and more frequent as the density and the pressure of the vapor increases. So as things, as vapor becomes more and more dense, is it 80%, 90%, 100% dense and filled full of vapor, more and more of those molecules are going to start to come back down into the liquid. That's because the, uh, the, the area is saturated with vapor. Now when the process of escape and return re reaches an equilibrium, the vapor is said to be saturated and no further change in the vapor pressure and density of the temperature or liquid temperature will occur. So for example, if you put water inside of a closed container and you heat it up, the water will begin to evaporate in that container until it fills the container with a cloud of water molecules. And at the point where the, the entire container is full of water molecules, there's going to be no further change in the pressure uh, and density of the, or the liquid temperature. So it's going to basically reach a, uh, a critical state where it will stay, stay and not move. You won't see any change in that um, pressure or density uh, or temperature. So this is what's called the evaporative equilibrium. When the evaporative pressure and temperatures, um, or the, at least the pressures, meet the surrounding environment and the temperatures will no longer change. So we talked about a couple things, in, uh, about, we said three key things for, the rate, or for helping evaporation. We talked about heat, we talked about air movement, uh, we talked about pressure. Now let's talk about some more uh, factors that influence the rate of evaporation. And this is important because we want to speed things up as much as possible. Time is money in the cannabis industry. Um, so it's important that our rate of evaporation is fast, that we're able to keep up. So some of those rates uh, are influenced by, first of all, the concentration of the substance evaporating into the air. Uh, if the air is already high concentration of the substance evaporating, well then the given substance will only evaporate more slowly. The example I gave earlier was humidity. 100% humidity in an environment means that you're not going to be able to evaporate any more moisture or, or, or um, liquid into the air because it is already 100% humid. You can't, you can't accept any more water. So the concentration of the uh, substance in the air is one factor. Now the concentration of other substances in the air are also another factor. So say you're in an enclosed dome and it's full of another gas filling up that voided space. Well then, how is your, how is your evaporative uh, substance going to be, have any room to make it into? So if there's other concentrations of substance in the air, that can also limit the amount of capacity for the substance evaporating. We talked about the flow rate of air. This is also in part related to the concentration points above. But basically, if there's fresh air or air that is neither saturated with the substance or other substances, if there's fresh, you know, open air available all the time moving over the substance, well then the concentration in the air is less likely to go up over time, meaning it's going to encourage faster rates of evaporation. This is the result of the boundary layer at the evaporation surface decreasing with the flow velocity. 
This means that the de decreasing the diffusion distance in the stagnant layer. So there's not a layer, um, basically a stagnant layer of molecules blocking uh, the evaporation from entering. So uh, that's due to the fresh air moving all the time and, and causing that uh, open space for molecules to enter. Now, intermolecular forces also have a play here. The stronger the forces keeping the molecules together in the liquid state, the more energy one must get to escape. This is characterized by the enthalpy of vaporization. So basic, basically, some molecules have stronger bonds than others. Electronegativity, protons, neutrons, uh, they all are different in their own properties. Some are more um, kinetically held together than others. Some are heavier than others. So the inter intermolecular forces also have a play on the rate of evaporation. Again, pressure is a huge influencing factor. Uh, evaporation is going to happen faster if there's less force exerted, keeping the surface molecules from launching themselves. Same thing goes for the gym example. If you're trying to evaporate or trying to lift weight right on the bench press, reducing the amount of weight on the bar is going to make it, you can do reps way faster. You're going to be able to push that bar up way faster than you would if there was a lot of pressure exerted on the bar. So I like to use that example um, because it really helps correlate the pressure and uh, temperature and also uh, the, just the amount of force needed to evaporate. Next, the surface area. Now, a substance that has a larger surface area will evaporate faster as there's more surface molecules per unit of volume that are potentially able to escape. Um, again, if you, have, you know, if you have water in a small puddle and it's deep, it's going to take a long time to evaporate. If you were to take water and sp spread it out over a big surface area, so say you had a big floor and you spread the water thin over the floor, it's going to evaporate much faster because molecules are now, you have a, a much more surface area or more molecules per unit of volume, which then have the potential to escape off the surface of the liquid. And finally, uh, another rate of uh, influence for the um, evaporation is the temperature of your substance. Now, the higher the temperatures, the more kinetic energy, the more uh, uh, heat is being applied, the more molecules at the surface, you know, the more exciting of the molecules means that they're more at the surface. It just means there's going to be a faster rate of evaporation. It also means you're going to boil much more um, you know, rapidly. You're going to cause much more energy to be applied to those molecules. And that can be a good thing and a bad thing uh, when it comes to degradation because we want to try to avoid any degradation of the product. Okay, so some facts and some myths. It's common misconception that in a liquid mixture at a given pressure, each component boils at the boiling point corresponding to the given pressure and the vapors of each component will collect separately and purely. This, however, does not occur even in an idealized system. So what this is saying is that basically if you mix substances together, say you mix water and oil and or uh, water and some other mixture, it's, it's a common misconception that it's just going to boil over um, and you're going to, you're going to get 100% pure compounds. That's not always the case. Uh, they don't necessarily, when you mix components together, you know, you really start, you start messing with physics um, and you're not always going to get the exact reproducible results because we're dealing with atoms and, you know, a small number of more atoms than another can cause uh, a big change. So when it comes, it's a common misconception that at given pressures, each component boils at the boiling point corresponding to that, to that pressure. Um, so you, you can't really expect with cannabis that you're always going to get the same exact distillation temperature or it's going to boil at the same exact temperature every single run because the mixtures are slightly different each time and that's going to um, cause the temperature to change. However, there are some laws in uh, or I, what they're called ideal gas laws uh, and these are laws surrounding gases and surrounding 
this idea of um, component mixtures. And it doesn't, I don't know if it would necessarily apply to the botanical cannabis product itself, but it definitely applies to other processes involved in laboratory. So it's important that we cover uh, Raoult's law and Dalton's law. And Raoult's law states that the vapor pressure of a solution is dependent on one, the vapor pressure of each chemical compound in the solution, two, the fraction of the solution each component makes, aka this is called the mole fraction. And this law applies to ideal gas or, or ideal solutions or ideal or solutions that have different components, but whose molecular interactions are the same or very similar to pure solutions. What it's saying here in Raoult's law is that when you have a mixture of components, the vapor pressure um, of the solution of all those mixtures is going to be dependent on the independent pressures of each. And then it's going to be dependent on how much of each is put into the fraction. So if you have a 50-50 mixture, um, you're going to have a different result than if you have a 60-40 mixture. Things are going to be a little different. And that has to do uh, with the vapor pressures of each uh, component mixture. Now, another law that you can refer to, and actually this one is uh, one that is, can be really applied to closed loop extraction and mixtures of gases. I know a lot of people who do hydrocarbon extraction, um, they do mixtures of butane, propane, and they want to know what the pressure is, or they want to they know based on the pressure what the mixture might be. Well, Dalton's law in chemistry and in physics, it's also called Dalton's law of partial pressures, states that in a mixture of non-reacting gases, again, non-reacting, that the total pressure exerted is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of the individual gases. So it's basically like adding up the individual pressures, the individual partial pressure, if you add them together, you're going to get your overall pressure of the mixture. And this is only applied to non-reacting gases. And this is an empirical law that was observed by John Dalton in 1801 and is related to what's called the ideal gas laws. So John Dalton in 1801 observed that when he was mixing gases together, that they, weren't, that they were non-reactive, first of all, and when he started mixing them together, that the pressure that he got in the end of all of those gases mixed was an equation that just added together the individual partial pressures of each gas to create one pressure total. So this is a good um, equation that you can always reference. And I just throw these in here so that people understand uh, the laws surrounding ideal gases. Um, and it helps for extractors. It's just good information to reference in case you need it. So let's get back to the distillation process. Um, I'm going to try and go through this quickly. We're going to, we're going to take a break here in just a minute, uh, probably around 12, 15 or so. I'll, I'll try to come to a good stopping point here. We'll take a quick lunch break. I know you, some of you are probably hungry. Um, so we'll take a quick break, let you guys go to the bathroom, eat some food, and then uh, we'll come back from the break and uh, we'll try to get into the live distillation demo, which I have set up for you guys here. So uh, let's just go through a couple types of distillation here. We talked about the first early on, which is batch distillation. You can see here we have one flask starting out with material that we want to distill. We have one receiving flask. This is done in a single batch, okay? Now how this is done is by heating an ideal mixture, we want to get ideal as possible, of two volatile substances. In this case, let's just say A and B. With A having the higher volatility or the lower boiling point. It's in a batch distillation setup as shown on the right, until, a mixture, until the mixture is boiling, resulting in vapor above the liquid, which contains a mixture of both A and B. So for this example, let's try to apply this to cannabis distillation. 
Now when we do separation of cannabis to make a distillate, which we'll do today, there's two really two main things that you're trying to look at separating. You're looking at trying to separate the uh, head fraction, which is generally just your terpenes and any maybe volatiles inside of the mixture. So in this A and B example, A is going to be your terpenes and B will be your cannabinoids. So what we want to do is begin to heat this component mixture until it begins to result in boiling of vapors above the liquid phase. And this vapor is going to contain both A and B. Now it's not going to just be 100% pure terpenes coming out. The ratio between A and B in the vapor will be different from the ratio in the liquid. Now the ratio in the liquid will be determined upon how it was originally mixed or how it was originally extracted. You're going to have maybe, you know, 5% terpenes and 95%, you know, or some other form of cannabinoids. And then you're going to have some impurities. So the mixture overall is going to determine uh, that portion. But the vapor portion is going to be more enriched in the component A. Because it is the more volatile fraction. It is the terpenes. It's the first thing that wants to boil off. It will be a higher ratio of A to B, but there will still be a slight small ratio of cannabinoid content in there. You cannot get rid of it all. Now, A, the vapor goes through the condenser and it is removed from the system. This in turn means that the ratio of compounds in the remaining liquid is now different from when we started. It's now going to be further enriched in cannabinoids because we've started to remove some terpenes. The result is the ratio in the liquid mixture is changing over time. It's becoming richer and richer, more heavier and heavier in cannabinoid content because we're removing more and more terpenes as we begin to remove the component A, which is the more volatile fraction. Now B, this is going to cause the boiling point of your mixture to is going to cause it to rise over time because we're starting to get more and more cannabinoid concentration and less terpenes, it means that our boiling point is going to be elevated. Um, it's going to also result in a change in the ratio from A to B, which is from terpenes to cannabinoids in the gas phase. As the distillation continues, there's going to start to be an increase in proportion of B or cannabinoids in the gas phase. So as we continue to heat things up and continue on, it's going to change from having, as we're mo moving all the terpenes, it's going to start changing in phase from A to B. And we're going to start seeing a larger amount of B in the output distillate. If the difference in vapor pressure between the two components, A and B, is large, which means it's generally just uh, referenced in boiling points, the mixture at the beginning of the distillation is highly enriched in component A. And when the component A has distilled off, the boiling liquid is enriched in component B. So that last sentence is saying here, if you have two, if the mixture that you started out with has boiling points that are very far different, say one boils at 100 degrees and the other boils at 200 degrees, they're nowhere close together. They're saying that to begin with, you're going to have a very high output, a very good purity of output of, of your A fraction because the boiling point is so far away from the cannab cannabinoid content that you should really mainly see terpenes come over. You will see a slight amount of cannabinoids, but the ratio overall is going to be very enriched in A of the mixture. So this is a simple batch distillation. Now, continuous distillation is an ongoing distillation where the liquid on the output or the distillate, the receiving flask, is recycled through the system without interruption. It's fed into the process and separate fractions are removed continuously as output streams occur over time during the operation. So basically, batch distillation, we have to start with one batch. We have to heat it up. We have to wait until the end before we can open everything up and take our, our results. Well, in continuous distillation, there is no single batch. You have, a, you have an input feed. You can start loading more and more product into it. it doesn't, it's not inside of a flask. You can, while it's under process, you can add more. And on the output is the same. It's continually outputting. 
so that you can constantly take the output feed and either re-loop it to the start or just take your end fraction as is. Um, continuous distillation differs from batch distillation in respect that the concentration should not change over time. Basically, in, in uh, continuous distillation, we have the ability to recycle to the start flask or to the beginning, and this allows us to dial in the exact uh, purity output that we're, we're looking for. Continuous distillation is commonly used in alcohol, whiskey, vodka, that kind of thing, where um, you want to check the output proof of the alcohol to ensure a consistent product. Now, um, I want to talk about something here in this slide. Uh, it says here, for any source material of a specific composition, the main variables that affect the purity of products in continuous dil distillation are the reflux ratio and the number of theoretical equilibrium stages in practice determined by the number of trays or the height of packing. Now I'm going to ask a question, does anybody in the chat room, has any of you guys heard of theoretical plating or column packing? Are you guys aware of what that means? If not, I'm happy, I'm going to go through and I'll show you guys an example. I'm going to switch over here and I will just say hello. You guys haven't seen me today. Apologize. I should have switched over to my camera so you guys can see me. Uh, but I have a distillation head here in my hands. And I want to talk quickly about theoretical plating because I mentioned it in this slide. Um, but here is our distillation column, okay? At the bottom, you can kind of see these little tiny indentations. It's a little hard to see here. But essentially, it's just some pokes in the glass. And what this is called is, this is our theoretical plating. Now, in a typical distillation column, say back in the early days when it was industrial, they'd be made out of metal or made out of glass too. But imagine this was a metal column or a tall straight pipe. Now, what we can do is we can, this theoretical plating we're talking about is essentially steps or stages. In a pipe, it would literally be like a zigzag up the pipe of basically flat flat shelves, like a staircase all the way up the column. What that is, is those are the theoretical plates. And those theoretical plates, what they do is they increase the amount of surface area in a distillation column. So a distillation column includes the length of the tube, the diameter of the tube, and that will give you the amount of surface area here. If we lengthen the column or increase the size of the column, we're going to create more surface area. Or if we put indentations or we put packing material inside this column, some people put glass beads in here, some people put stainless steel ball bearings inside, we're essentially creating more surface area inside this column. And that is called a theoretical plate. And that additional surface area, what happens is, we'll talk more about um, the theoretical plating in fractional distillation further on. What this essentially does is it causes a higher purity output. The output of the purity is going to go through these stages, these theoretical plates, and as it travels through this additional surface area, the hot vapors are going to cool on this additional plating or on this additional surface area, and they're going to want to fall back down into the flask because it's touching all this cold surface area as it travels up the column. It's saying, oh, I got a place to hang out on this extra surface area. I'm going to condense here and stay for a second. And that content is going to go back down to the flask and is called refluxing. Now, a column has two properties, the theoretical plating or the surface area and the reflux ratio is how much will that reject the liquid through the column back down into your flask. And we will see that happen today, and you guys will have a good example of reflux live as we do the distillation. And that reflux ratio, or the amount of refluxing that it goes back down to the flask, uh, determines whether or not you need to increase the amount of sur surface area or theoretical platings, or remove the amount of surface area or theoretical plating. 
Now, how can we improve batch distillation and continuous distillation? Well, we can improve it by making use of a fractionating column. There is simple distillation heads, which are essentially just a, a column on top of a flask. And then there's the fractionating column, which essentially just adds all this theoretical plating. This column improves separation by providing a larger surface area for the vapor and condensate to come into contact. This helps it remain at equilibrium for as long as possible. The column can consist of small subsystems called trays or dishes or steps or stairs, which all contain an enriched boiling liquid mixture, all with their own vapor liquid equilibrium. So each level of stair going up the column as it gets higher and higher, the liquid is going to condense and each area or stage is going to have a little bit different purity. And that's one of the effects of the distillation column for fractional distillation columns is it will increase the output purity due to the additional surface area refluxing in stages. Now there's differences between laboratory scale and industrial scale fractionating columns, but really the principles are all the same, right? And I'll show you guys a couple examples of some distillation columns that increase the surface area and cause this additional reflux or this additional equilibrium stages. So you're seeing here depicted three different distillation columns. We have a Snyder, and it's a little bit difficult to kind of see from this 2D image the shape, but you can get a glimpse that it is a pinched tube and poked tube. And all it is is just creating additional surface area on the inside. Then next to it, you have the Vigro column. The Vigro column is what we commonly use in the industry. It's what we have incorporated in our distillation heads at Open Source Steel. Um, it's pretty much the mainstay for surface area addition you're going to see in columns on all the comp competition out there as well. Finally, you're going to see the Widmer. Uh, this is similar. It just has a concentric tube and rod with a spiral on it stuck in the column. So it just adds, it's like a candy cane um, spiral stuck down into the tube, which adds some additional surface area and creates this little spiral network for vapor to condense on and fall back down. Now you'll see on the first two examples of distillation columns that they're just a straight tube. Okay, it's a glass tube with some joints on the top and bottom with the additional um, pinching and poking on the sides of the tube. Now the last one, the third one on the right hand side, the one difference between the first two is that it has an additional jacket around the outside, which I just wanted to make uh, a note of. That gray portion that's filled in surrounding that Widmer condenser, I'm sorry, Widmer column is a vacuum jacket. So what's been done there is basically they use during the creation of manufacturing, they'll pull a, a, a negative pressure on that jacket, which insulates temperatures uh, from the outside. So it insulates from temperatures in the room or environment from affecting the distillation column. Uh, for instance, if you're in a cold environment or a cold laboratory or you got a fan blowing by you, uh, if you do not insulate the outside of the column, well then the outside temperatures can affect your distillation column and it can cause gradients in temperature. It means that you can basically cool down your distillation column from the cold air and it act, starts acting as a condenser rather than a distillation column um, and it can, it can mess up your end results. So, moving on, uh, obviously we have laboratory scale distillation. It differs uh, almost exclusively, or excuse me, laboratory scale distillations are almost exclusively run as batch distillations. Um, you just commonly see, like we're doing today, we are doing a batch distillation. The device used in distillation sometimes is referred to as a still, or a flask, or a pot. And it consists of, at minimum, a boiler or a pot, in which the source material is heated and a condenser where the heated vapor is cooled back into the liquid state. And then you have a receiver of some types or a flask or a jar in which the concentrate is purified or the purified liquid is called a distillate is, is collected. 
So anytime you're refining using distillation and you collect the product, it's going to be called a distillate. There's several different type of laboratory scale techniques that exist for distillation, and we'll cover some of those here. Ryan is asking, is the Widmer column the best option? Uh, Ryan, you know, the, the option it depends on the amount of reflux that you're seeing. Uh, we have seen in our industry the uh, application of short path heads from chem glass um, and ace glass and Leboy and us, of course, and some other competitors. Uh, but the size and design of columns are pretty much where they need to be. The Widmer would probably add too much additional surface area. That will cause a high reflux ratio because there's so much surface area added that it can actually cause uh, too much retention in the, in the column. So basically as vapor travels through the column, it kind of gets trapped in there because it wants to condense on all the spiraling glass and it wants to try and make it up the column, but it keeps fighting itself and condensing. And that added time exposed as a vapor is when you have the most heat applied to your product. So the more time you have that sitting in the column, it's called retention time. The higher the retention time of heat in your column, the higher the likelihood of degradation or isomerization of your cannabinoids can be. So one common thing you'll see in the industry is delta 9 THC will be converted into delta 8 THC or you'll also see CBN, which is another conversion from THC. So the amount of retention time or residence time the amount of time it resides in the column is also an important factor. So we've really tried to just make it so that the condenser and the, uh, sorry, the distillation column will, will create a high enough purity output but won't cause too much residence time. All right, uh, we're going to continue a couple more slides. Let me just see here. I think I'm going to finish like three or four more slides. I'm going to go through them pretty quick um, and we'll just talk about them really quick. We talked about laboratory scale distillation. We also have simple distillation. This is, this is basically um, the most simple is form of distillation. It does not use any sort of additional surface area in the column. It will just generally be a straight column or sometimes a bent column. It doesn't include any additional surface area. This is what's called a simple distillation. It's basically vapor is immediately channeled into a condenser and then condensed and collected. Now, as a result, simple distillation is really only effective. You'd only really want to use simple distillation when your boiling points between whatever you're trying to separate are greater than 25 degrees Celsius apart from each other. So if you want to separate like water and salt, well, that's pretty easy to do. The, the difference in boiling point is very, very big. So it's easy to do it through simple distillation. Because water will boil off at 200, 200 degrees Fahrenheit, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, and the salt will basically just stay behind. So simple distillation will work for that kind of process. Um, but it's when the boiling points are too close together that you'll need to use fractional. So here's, a, here's an image or a depiction of a simple distillation setup. You'll notice there's a flask with some heated water and there's a column on top of the flask and not a very large one, just a short distillation column. The channel for the, the vapors to travel through. Go into the liquid condenser and then collect it as soft water on the output. So there's going to be no minerals or anything like that. It's going to be distilled water. So simple distillation works for that kind of process because the minerals and the heavy compounds inside of your water are a higher boiling point. It means a simple distillation will work just fine. Now fractional distillation, for many cases, the boiling points of the components in the mixture are going to be so sufficiently close that that's where we need to start taking into account Raoult's law. And uh, we need to start looking at a fractional distillation column. Uh, because in order to separate the components, we need to do a repeated vaporizing and condensing cycles within the column. So hear me out. We talked about um, 
you know, the ratio in A and B mixture, say we have a mixture that's 50% one solution and 50% another, as we begin to evaporate, the vapor that comes out of that mixture is going to be higher in concentration of the more volatile component. Now, as it travels up through a distillation column, it's going to want to condense on a fractional distillation column on the theoretical plating. Now, as that liquid condenses on the plating, it's going to be higher purity at that point. How high of a purity, we're not exactly sure unless we were to test it. Test it. However, throughout the column, at each stage up the column is going to be a different potency in purity. Because as things go from a liquid phase to a vapor phase, you're going to get an increase in concentration. So with a fractional distillation column, it's going to have this repeated cycle of condensing in on a plate. Uh, as the hot vapors are traveling up the column, it's going to excite those vapors that condensed on the plate. They're going to turn back into a vapor. They're going to travel up one stage in the column and they might condense again. And each time they recondense back on a stage, they're going to condense in a little bit higher of a purity as it travels up the column. This is why fractional distillation is so important for boiling points that are really sufficiently close together. And each, uh, vaporation, each uh, vapor to condensing cycle, that's what's called the theoretical plating. Um, and that cycle over and over is what's going to produce a very high purity output and why we use fractional distillation for cannabinoid content. Uh, now at the bottom paragraph here, it says more theoretical plates are going to lead to better separation which is true. It's going to cause more stages for this purity to slightly increase each step up the column. However, it will cause more residence time because you're going to cause more stages at which the liquid has to condense and transfer into a vapor. It's going to cause a lot of energy to be applied and removed from that solution and it can cause degradation or isomerization. Now, theoretical plates, they're just a concept rather than an accurate description. They're, they're theoretical. They're not, you know, you can't, you can't judge the exact purity at each stage. It's more of a theoretical process. And that's why we add packing or we add stages um, and more surface area to try to achieve a desired output. So here is a fractionating column. It looks just like the previous image, except for this one has a flask with some water in it. And instead of using a standard distillation column right on top, a short little distillation column, you can see this one has a fractionating column on top. And it shows the stages or the plating throughout the head. This could be bigger indentation. This could be a Widmer condenser. This could be any style of fractionating column. Essentially, it's just adding a bunch of extra area surface in there for that vapor to try and cool down on like cold fingers and then revaporize again by the hot vapors traveling up to the column. And it, this repeated cycle of condensing back down and turning back into a vapor is causing it each stage throughout the column to become higher purity throughout. And then when you have your condenser, your output purity will be of the highest fraction you can achieve. So now we talked about reflux. Reflux is when those liquid starts to condense. It, uh, is, a, is a technique involving the condensation of vapors and then the return of this condensate to the system from which it originated. It's used in industrial and in laboratory scale distillation. So as vapors travel up the column, they're going to condense on those theoretical plates. And some of them are just going to fall right back down in the flask because they're not pure enough. Maybe they still have too many impurities in them and they condensed because they're not pure enough. They're not, they don't have enough energy. So they fall back down into the flask and they just repeat the cycle over and over until there's enough energy or the purity is high enough that it can make it through the theoretical plating. So this reflux is something we're going to watch today. We're going to take a note of it and we're going to um, control our reaction through the amount of reflux. I think we got like two more slides. Yeah, we're going to do two more slides and then we'll get to break here at lunch. We'll take about uh, 
30, 45 minute break, and then we'll get back into it. I know we have at least probably around maybe two to th or three hours of distillation to go through today with the setup. Um, but I want to make sure you guys got full bellies and you guys are awake for that. So we'll take a break before we get into the actual demo. All right, so we talked about simple distillation, right? We talked about fractional distillation. Simple dist distillation is when we have boiling points that are, you know, further apart from each other and it makes sense that we can use a simple distillation head. We don't need all this theoretical plating to try and create a high purity output. That's done. Um, if I go back and I show you the picture, you can see that the output of the flask for the water is just being collected into a cup. You know, it's just, we're heating it up with, we're not doing this under a vacuum. Same for this fractional distillation. The output is just being dripped into a beaker. It's not in a closed system. We're essentially doing this at atmospheric pressures. We're doing this at room temperature, room pressure. Now this next slide is going to talk about vacuum distillation. This is where we're going to start introducing vacuum into the equation. And what do I mean by that? I, re I mean vacuum is, an, is a controller of pressure. So we can control the amount of pressure using a vacuum. We can remove atmospheric pressure by putting things inside of a closed environment and removing the atmospheric pressure by using a vacuum. So some compounds have a very high boiling points. In the case of cannabis, it has an extremely high boiling point. Now to boil such compounds, it's often better to lower the pressure at which such compounds are boiled instead of to increase the temperature. So for cannabis, instead of trying to distill at extremely high temperatures, well, we want to try to remove the amount of heat because we don't want to degrade the product, we don't want to, we don't want to change the structure of the, the molecules and isomers. We want to remove the heat as much as possible, so what we do is we use a vacuum. And that's going to decrease the pressure, which is going to decrease the boiling point. Now once the pressure is lowered to the vapor pressure of the compound at the given temperature, boiling and the rest of the distillation can process can commence. So this technique is referred to as vacuum distillation and is commonly found in the laboratories in the form of a rotary evaporator. I have a photo of a rotary evaporator here. Most of you guys have seen a rotary evaporator in our industry. They're extremely common devices in a laboratory. Rotary evaporators are used most often than not for removing alcohol. They do really well at removing alcohol. Um, and they rotate. So the flask here, the small flask on the end, rotates around in a circle inside of a hot water bath. And that rotating allows the surface area to be increased. And basically a simple, uh, well, a distillation process can happen, a simple distillation process can happen under a reduced temperature using vacuum. And that is what a rotary evaporator is commonly used for. We also pull a vacuum on the distillation of of our short path or fractional distillation kit too. Um, and we're pulling a much deeper vacuum. We pull an extremely deep vacuum because the goal with our fractional distillation is to reduce the temperature we have to apply for the process. We don't want to degrade the cannabinoids. We don't want to degrade anything uh, more than it might already from the heat we use. And finally, before we take break on lunch, we're talking molecular distillation. Now molecular distillation is vacuum distillation below the pressure of 0 0.01 torr or below 0.00019336777 PSI. So we're talking extremely low pressures. We're talking about nearly being in space when it comes to molecular distillation. And the key here is that at 0 0.01 torr, it's one order of magnitude above a high vacuum uh, where fluids are in the free molecular flow regime. And what that means is that in the free molecular flow, the gaseous phase no longer exerts significant pressure on the substance to be evaporated and consequently the rate of evaporation no longer determined by pressure. So what does that mean exactly? Let's just use an analogy of being in space. Okay, say we're all at the space station right now 
and I'm 10 feet, feet away from you. And how are you going to get from you to me without pushing off of something, without exerting some force or pressure? Well, if we're floating in free space, there's no way that you can get to me through pressure. The fluid dynamics or the fluid uh, or the the, the, the flow of fluid dynamics through pressure no longer work. We're in the free molecular flow regime here, where basically molecules are suspended in space, and the only thing moving molecules around is their attraction to one another through electricity or through electronegativity uh, or the bonds of their, their atoms. So the uh, molecular distillation is even a deeper level of vacuum and is commonly used in a thin film or white film evaporator. And this is really what is a true short path distillation. I'll show you a video of a unit in action at the end of some, just some video showing you how they work and what they look like. But essentially this is about the deepest level of vacuum that we can achieve for distillation which means this is the deepest or the lowest temperature we're going to achieve with our distillation for cannabinoids right now. Uh, so I just want to throw that in there so that you guys understand that vacuum distillation and molecular distillation are slight difference. Vacuum distillation will reduce the pressure using vacuum. Molecular distillation is the free molecular flow regime where there's no longer fluid dynamics at play and instead it's more molecular forces that are at play. Okay, with that, uh, we will take a little bit of a break here. It is 12.23 p.m. on my side. We will take about a half hour break. Maybe we'll get started again at 1 p.m. That seems fair. Um, so please take your time, use the restroom, go ahead and get some food in you, and we will pick back up in around 40 minutes or so. Uh, if any of you guys have any questions, you guys can feel free to reach out to me and uh, we'll try to fix it. And David, I'm not sure if you're still having issues with your live stream. Um, maybe we could try to work together to see if uh, we can find out what's going on your end. Um, but just reach out if you need. So we'll go on lunch and we'll be back in around 35 minutes or so.
right, this is going to be your official five-minute warning that we will go ahead and get started back on the second portion of today's lecture and lab. We'll be doing the uh, live distillation demo here coming up. So we get about five minutes and we'll get back into it. Ryan is asking me, will the live demo be available after class as well? Yes, uh, all this content I'm going to try to make available post uh, the class for at least a short period in time so you guys can review it. We also have a produced DVD that we should be able to uh, provide to you as well. Uh, we, I know that it is finished. Um, it is completed. I think there might be a final like last little touch to put on it. Uh, but that will be coming shortly after the class as well for you guys. It is a produced, more official um, you know, video for you. So uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, if you need, I can uh, try to make it downloadable as well.
All right, we're going to get back into things here. This. All right, but before we finally get back into the last couple slides uh, before the actual live demonstration for the distillation process, I want to make sure that I get a uh, head count here, make sure that we check in with everybody to see uh, how you're doing with connection wise. Um, and just make sure everybody is with us. Uh, I'm going to call out your name here. And if you could do me a favor and just reply in the Hangout meeting that you are here and ready, uh, then we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, if you're not in the Google Hangouts and you're viewing this just from the YouTube live stream, um, I uh, would appreciate if you could just send me an email, at least just confirming, hey, josh at opensourcesteel.com, I'm here. Uh, that way I know that everybody's ready to go. Um, I'm going to call out David C. If you're here, just say here. Ryan C, Kenny G, which I believe is for Christina, um, Jonathan R, John R, and Christian T, looking for Christian. Ryan is ready, Christina is ready. All right, John is ready. David said he was having some issues. I'll have to sort that out with him. And I'm not sure if a Christian ever made it into today's session. All right, so I think we're okay to go ahead and get ready going. I'll finish there. All right, so we have a couple more slides just to kind of finish up and then we'll get hands on into the lab demo here. Um, I just wanted to talk about a little bit about um, short path distillation, uh, not really any more into the, um, not really any more into the variables or the details of, uh, of distillation, but more about uh, the components of what's gonna go into making your own distillation equipment. Um, the, the basic components that are going to make up a distillation kit so that in case you, you want to go source your own product out there in the market, you know what things you're going to be looking for in order to piece together uh, a kit best suited for cannabis distillation. So this image here is of our five liter distillation set uh, provided at open source steel. <clears throat> We're going to kind of break down all of the individual components here and talk about what's needed in order to do a successful distillation. So first things first, uh, we have, I will kind of give you guys a shot actually of the set we're going to be using today. So I have a couple different camera angles set up for you guys. So hopefully you'll be able to get, you know, close enough uh, on say the flask. And if we need to get closer, we can get you closer. Or if we need to look at the receiving flask, we can kind of change views today to hope, hopefully show you guys uh, close up the process as it's happening. Christina is asking, is, is, is this everything that's going to be included in the starter kit? Uh, so we will talk about what's provided uh, by Open Source Steel. We do have a complete distillation kit available and the components that you're looking at in this are going to cover that. back on screen here so the first things first you're going to need for any distillation kit is some source of heat and uh, what we offer is a heating mantle that has a magnetic stir feature now one thing i want to note about heating mantles is if you're looking for a heating mantle on the market you want to find one size for your flask uh, today we're going to be using a two liter flask so we have a two liter heating mantle you're going to want to buy an appropriately sized heating mantle for the flask you're using. Uh, some people ask me if it's okay to use, like, say, a two liter flask and a five, five liter mantle. It can be okay. However, you're going to lose some heat. It's not going to be as efficient. Um, and you might want to think about packing uh, the outside around it. Some of these mantles, you can pack sand in them. And uh, so I wouldn't recommend it. 
uh, to be honest. I would just suggest getting appropriately sized uh, mantles for each flask. Uh, the next thing about this heating mantle is that it's digital. The, the heating mantle itself does not have a knob for turning the temperature. You set the temperature on the actual device itself and you press set and the point is digitally read there. The magnetic stir feature though is, is a manual stir feature. So there's a knob on the front of this heating mantle that controls the magnetic stir at the bottom of the heating mantle. Um, and it's kind of nice to actually have a manual one in uh, most cases because the magnetic feature will allow you to, uh, or sorry, the manual feature will allow you to really dial it in uh, with control. If you're using a digital feature, trying to notch it up one or two RPMs at a time, you don't get the best feel. I would say. I like, the, I like the manual stir feature with the digital heat. <clears throat> Next item you're going to need is you're going to need a thermocouple or a thermoprobe. And this is going to be plugged into your mantle. Uh, our mantles are provided with a thermocouple. And in fact, they're provided with an extra in case uh, one goes out. Um, so the, the heating mantle and the thermocouple go together. This is going to read the temperature of the liquid inside of your flask. It's basically going to read back to your heating mantle, letting it know, hey, you need to be on or off. You're not hot enough for the distillation process. In the case of uh, what we use, we need a two-neck boiling flask. So you could be a five-liter flask, a two-liter flask. We're going to be using a two-neck, two-liter boiling flask today. The reason for the two necks is because one, obviously, is going to be for the distillation column. And then the other one is going to be mainly for what you can see in this you're seeing we have two necks in this one one is for our thermal couple here our thermal probe it's going to go here and our distillation head is going to go on top so that's our two neck two liter boiling flask the joint sizes on here are standard 2440 which is very common it's a 24 millimeters across by 20 uh 24 long or sorry 24 millimeters across by 40 long it's got that long kind of shape. Next thing you're going to need is some thermocouple adapters. These are the adapter probes that are put here in the actual flask to adapt the thermocouple into the joint. It'll basically squeeze around the outside of the probe, creating a nice tight seal. And that's the thermocouple adapters. We have a couple of those uh, used throughout the system. This is for just monitoring temperatures. You'll need some metal cat clips, and I specifically point out metal here because on the boiling flask, I'll show you here, on our boiling flask, it's going to be very hot. So we want to make sure to use a metal cat clip anywhere where we're going to be in contact with this hot flask. So I'm going to make sure to use one uh, there. Those are sized for the actual uh, joint. You're going to need a distillation head in the course of today. We're going to be using this distillation head. This is a two liter distillation head from Open Source Steel or Open Source Scientific. This is a pretty standard design on the market. Uh, companies like Chemglass have been producing this for many, many years. Uh, we just come out with our own version. And essentially, you have a short bent distillation column. Uh, up here, we're going to use a penny stopper, but this is where one of the other Thermo probes can go, or the thermo adapters for connecting a thermometer can go inside of here. Speaking of thermometers, if you want to go ahead and use a thermometer in this distillation head, I'll show you what it looks like here. Here's a thermometer that you can probe inside the top of the head here. So you'll take either um, one with a, a lead on it that you can set the, set the base down somewhere and have the thermometer on a, a long uh, cable. Or you can use one of those kind of kitchen style thermometers where it will go straight into the, the source of the meat or whatever you're trying to measure the liquid of. Um, and then of course there's the old school mercury style thermometers you'd see at a, a school or a laboratory of some sorts. Those are not quite as accurate because they are, you know, uh, a gauge you got to read physically with your eyes and they're using mercury. Digital gauges are really a little bit better uh, to use today. We have modern technology so why not use some modern technology? Again, that's going to go in the top of the joint. Now, if you plan to measure the top, if you, if you plan to measure uh, the temperature 
of the vapors traveling through this column at the top of the head. That's what this is intended for. You want to make sure that your, your thermometer only goes, let me see if I can show you here, right to the stream of the vapor. You see, if I was to set a thermometer, I'd only want to set the thermometer right here. I'm not going to want to set the thermometer down here or all the way up here. I'm going to want to set it right in the path of travel for the condenser. Okay, so thermometer can be put in this joint here. And again, you want to make sure that it's right at the path of travel. Next item is going to be what's called our cow or our pig. This is a receiving flask. This is one portion of the receiving end of the distillate. Uh, this is going to have three different joints off of it. This is going to connect to our distillation head. This is going to allow us to rotate under vacuum, and you'll see me rotate today. Um, and it allow me to select uh, which flask I want to collect into without opening up the system. And for those joints, we want to use plastic cat clips. There's no need to use metal here. We can just use some plastic clips. They're not going to get too hot and melt. You only really need to use the metal close to the glass where it's hot. Of course, we need some receiving flasks to collect our end product into. And today we're going to be using 250 milliliter flasks. They're all sized with 2440 joints, which is a standard glass joint. We're going to need a cold trap or a condenser. This is going to use, be used to protect our vacuum. Um, it's important, it's very critical that we watch our vacuum through this process. We're operating under the most deep vacuum we can try to achieve here. And uh, by adding this cold trap prior to our vacuum, I'll show you, it's right here. Let me switch over to this one. So our cold trap is going to be standing up here. Uh, we're going to use dry ice today and alcohol, and we're going to cool this cold trap down significantly to help protect any gases passing through it before it goes into our vacuum pump. It's going to condense any volatile vapors that might be in there, um, and so that's going to help us out with that. The cold trap is going to have a flask for collection also. This is also included in our, our complete kit. Next, uh, I put on the list, this is, this is not included in our kit, but it is nice to know about or nice to have. Um, and I'll see if I could show you guys why. So underneath our cold trap here, down in this, this flask here, we wanna make sure that it doesn't keep evaporating and, and trying to re-evaporate re out of this flask. So we'll put some dry ice in a dish underneath that just to protect it. Here's some accessories you're going to want to have. Um, we do include some of these in our kit. Actually, most of them are included in our kit, but the heat gun, and that is pretty much it. The heat gun is the only item not included with our kit, uh, but the, you're going to need a stir bar. You're going to need some sort of magnetic stir bar that will help keep your solution moving at all times, spinning. The flask is going to be, or the stir bar is going to be rotating in the flask. That's due to the magnetic stir feature on our mantle. You're going to want a stir bar retriever. Uh, that's what I have today for my little pointer. This stir bar retriever has a magnet on the end of it. This is going to help if you need to pull out any magnetic retriever or stir bars during the process. Um, sometimes those magnetic stir bars can go bad. They can actually lose their magnetism. Heat and magnet do not go well together. And also, if it gets stuck in the magnet, it's, the stir bar feature is spinning underneath and the magnet is not moving with it, it can demagnetize it. So this can help pull out the old stir bars and we can uh, retrieve it with this. You're gonna need some vacuum hosing. Today we're using uh, a thick gauge silicone vacuum tubing. It's gonna be used to hook up all of our connections for vacuum. We need some cork rings for helping to store those round bottom flasks to keep them upright. Um, it's nice to have extras on hand to set your flasks in so they don't tilt over. You're going to need some lab stands and lab jacks um, to hold up your glassware that comes in our kit, our accessories package. And then finally, you're going to need vacuum grease, which is key to this process. The glass joints are ground very accurately. They're ground down to a very accurate millimeter size. But under the vacuum levels we're trying to reach, it's not perfect. So we need to use some grease. Everybody, every glass manufacturer is going to be using grease in a high vacuum situation. 
and that grease is going to help seal our joints even better and create a perfect vacuum tight seal. And then finally, there's of course a heat gun on here, which can be useful when things get sticky. You know, you want to make stuff move. Uh, we're going to need a recirculating heater and chiller. Today we are using a 7 liter recirculator, which I can show you a chiller. Um, the chiller is only going to cost extra cost, added cost I should say. If it's not necessary for the process, you can get away with just having a heater. Some people even use sous vides and a pond pump or even cheaper alternatives than a recirculating heater. These can, be, these can get a little expensive. Um, and so people are looking to save money on a budget sometimes tend to do a do-it-yourself approach using a water heater and a recirculating pump. and They get all sorts of fancy with this, saving money. I would say in the long run, just invest in a heater. It's worth it. It's made life way simpler for us. And then finally, <clears throat> the most key crucial component in all of the distillation process that we're doing is our vacuum. And why is this so important? Well, again, we're trying to reduce the boiling points of our mixtures. We're, we're not trying to boil at high temperatures. We're trying to preserve cannabinoids. We're trying to preserve as much of the process as possible without overheating it. So the vacuum is going to help remove the pressure in the system. Just like the example of going to the gym, it's going to remove the weight on the bar. It's going to make it so we don't have to work so hard to do this distillation. So choosing a really good vacuum is going to be key. For today's class, we're using the Welch 1400B Duo Seal. This is the image that we have on screen. This is a really reliable pump. You can see from the image it's built like a tank. It really is. It's solid steel construction, cast and milled out. It's got a, a, it's a belt driven pump, so the rotation of the, 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 the actual device is pretty slow uh, and safe and quiet. Very quiet pump. In fact, I'll turn it on real quick and I'll see if you guys can hear much of it. Ready? Very quiet pump. And uh, so a couple of good things about this and, and things to note when you're looking for vacuum pumps. If you don't want to use a Welch, you know, there's other options in the market. There's different styles of vacuum pumps and that's something we can leave for a little bit later on the discussion. But you're going to want to find a rotary vane pump. That's probably the best option on the market, an oil-filled rotary vane pump for distillation. And uh, this one here, the reason we choose it is because of the, the level of vacuum. So look at the key points down here. It's a single stage belt drive pump for vacuum applications such as drying manifolds, freeze drying, vacuum ovens, glove boxes, degassing, concentrations, and distillation. It does 25 liters per minute of displacement, so it means it's going to displace about 25 liters of, of space per minute or of gases. And it has the ultimate vacuum level of 0 0.0001 torr, which is extremely, extremely deep of a vacuum. Okay, it's a really, really deep vacuum here. Uh, it's, one of the, it's one of the most reliable pumps on the market. There's other pumps made by Edwards, uh, Alcatel, um, Agilent. There's a, other pump makers out there, but the Welch is definitely a reliable pump, and that's why we're using it for today's class, and it's why we stand behind it. Really easy to rebuild, too. Uh, and then you can also use a digital vacuum gauge throughout the process. Today I have one on hand to show you guys what it looks like. I have a, uh, let's see, I have a bullseye gauge here, which is cook, hooked up over here to the vacuum. It's always a good idea to take a digital gauge like this, which I have, and hook it up to your vacuum pump before you begin doing any sort of distillation. You want to test it, okay? Make sure the oil is fresh in your vacuum pump, brand new oil. And then when you put it on, you want to make sure to warm up the pump for about 10 minutes and test before you actually test it. It's going to take about 10 minutes for the oil to really warm up and kind of get up to temperatures before you can actually use it um, properly. So you want to make sure that that, that oil is heated up and then after it's heated up you can use that gauge 
to connect to the system and test your vacuum. You want to make sure that your vacuum is reading factory levels, or if not, close to it. I've gone ahead and I did a test on this the other day. Uh, I tested it down to 50 microns with my, ga my gauge. 50 microns is sufficient for our operation. Um, Welch sends these out of the factory. If they hit 25 microns and under, then they are good to go uh, in Welch's eyes. So this one hit 50. It's not quite perfect factory, but it, it's been used. It's been loved. We've done a lot of classes using it. Uh, I just changed out the oil, hit about 50 microns. It's, way, it's definitely good for today. It's, it's more than sufficient for running today. So if your pump's hitting 50 microns, you know that you got enough vacuum level to achieve what you need. Um, and that gauge is going to help identify it. You can use a regulator as well. It's not really recommended. Only for alcohol distillation is really a vacuum regulator really regulator useful. It helps if things get a little too violent because you reduce too much pressure. You can open up the regulator and add pressure, which will basically stop reactions. It'll slow it down. So if you want to do alcohol, which can be very volatile, um, a regulator would be well uh, good. Let's see, there's some questions uh, I'd like to answer. Christina is asking, how many milliliters are you going with uh, and are you going to work with when you show the distillation? I'm going to try and follow along. I have around 260 grams, 260 milliliters in here of extract, okay? Just over 250. I've done a winterization process prior to the class, so I've done winterizing of the product, and actually let's kind of touch on that after, let me make sure there's no more slides. Uh, I don't know if these are really necessarily important. I will show them quickly. I just want to show you other forms of distillation. There is a Kugleror, which is a Kugleror, which is another device. I would not recommend it. Just to show you, if you want to do some research, here's an image of it showing you what it looks like. Here's a wiped film, thin film evaporator, and uh, some other forms of distillation you can look into. I wouldn't say they're really relevant. It's just more so content you can look into. Uh, is there any questions up until this point before we really get into the lab? I kind of covered the history, the origins, talked about design. We've talked about distillation and theory. Uh, we've talked about you know, different methods of distillation, whether it's basic or fractional, or I mean simple or fractional, to molecular or vacuum distillation. Uh, we've covered a lot of concepts regarding distillation. Now I think it's time to kind of get hands on turn on some stuff, start putting together the glassware, and really get deep into the actual process of distillation. So if there's no questions surrounding the slides thus far, which again will be available after the class, you have already a link to directly to the slides, so feel free to go on to that um, and review the slide and all the material that we presented today at your own leisure. Um, that will be available to you permanently. There's no, that's not going away. That content will always be there. Um, the class videos, that is something I will have to work on after the class to make available uh, just because it's not as convenient on YouTube to share private videos. So we'll have to, I, I do have to look into um, just confirming that that will be able to happen. Uh, but we also have the DVD version of the class, which all students will have. Um, that's part of what you pay for. Um, you will be getting a copy of that as soon as it is released. It's already finished. Like I said, we've already produced the entire DVD. Um, it's just now kind of we're finalizing some of the last little touches on it. I think it's just the marketing material for it. After that, we're done. Um, so you'll all receive copies of that. I also intend to give you guys two hours of consultation time. So if you need something and you need to contact me, um, and you need to, if you have questions or whatever, for whatever reason, after the class, you can reach out to me. I'll be available for you guys as a resource for about two hours per student. And so if you have questions about the slide or what you saw during the presentation, you can always ask me and I'll help you out. I honestly don't think you guys will have too much challenges out there. This is a pretty straightforward process. Um, there is a couple of tips and tricks about, for instance, winterizing you need to be careful of. So let's talk about that. I'll, I'm going to bring in a couple of things and we're going to talk about winterization and why it's important prior to distillation. So who here 
has seen one of these. You know what this is. It's kind of dirty because I've used it. But this is a Buchner funnel. This is essentially a coffee filter. It's a fancy glass filter. It's got a glass filter disc in here. And essentially what this is used for is for filtering any material before distillation. Now, why would you want to filter material before distillation? Well, for starters, you don't want material like this in your extract, okay? So this here is fats and lipids that I extracted or pulled out from our material. So this came from today's starting material. These are fats and lipids. There is a little bit of cannabinoids I'm sure still left in here. I'm going to filter them again uh, just to make sure to get them lightened up make sure to take any oils out of them. But these fats and lipids were present in the starting crude material before we began. You, need to, you, you want to remove as much of those fats and lipids as possible before you be, begin your distillation because we talked about it during the slides. Any sort of impurities are going to elevate the boiling points. They're going to make it so you have to boil things at higher temperatures. So removing those impurities is going to increase our potency. It's going to increase our starting crude potency. It's going to maybe make it from 60% to 75% or, you know, depending on how much impurities you can pull out. You can actually increase the purity starting and that's our end goal is we want to try to re reach an ideal solution before we begin distilling. So I pulled out all of these fats and lipids beforehand using the Buchner funnel. Oops, excuse me. So the Buchner funnel is this apparatus I showed you guys here. And essentially what you would do is you would attach it to a flask like this. Okay, now essentially we just have a flask to collect everything into and we have our funnel where we can pour our material through. Now it's not as easy as just taking your material, heating it up and warm and pouring it through this thing to get all those fats and lipids out of there. You actually need to do what's called winterizing process. So prior to putting any oil inside of our starting flask, which you can see, I'll get you guys closer up here. There's a dark material inside of this flask. There's already our crude starting material in here. It is a little bit dark in color. But before I actually put it in the flask, I mixed our oil with alcohol. So here's a jug of alcohol. I took around two liters. So this full container was what I started with. I started with a full container of around two liters and I put 260 grams in this two liter container. So the ratio is roughly 10 to one. So you have around 10 liter, or I'm sorry, two liters here to every 200 grams or 200 milliliters of oil. I put a little more oil in there, so it was a little less than 10 to 1. But the idea is to try to create a, a diluted solution of oil and alcohol. And then what I'll do is I take that and I put this solution on dry ice or inside of a negative um, freezer, a negative 40 to negative 80 degree temperature, low temperature freezer. And when I've done that, after I've dissolved all my oil in here, I'll have a brown alcohol mixture dissolved in here. I'll take this alcohol mixture with my oil and I'll put it in dry ice for around 12 hours at minimum. The longer you wait, the better. So I, I like to go at least 24 hours. I'll leave my alcohol and oil solution on dry ice for 24 hours at minimum. And by the time, it, even within about an hour or so, the fats or lipids start to solidify in those cold temperatures. As they're suspended in the alcohol, the fats, the lipids start to coagulate. They start to become solid. And that was in Celsius, Christina. Negative 40 C to negative 80 C. Our fats and lipids will start to, to solidify uh, because of those cold temperatures. They want to make things solidify. So fats start to clump together and things start to settle towards the bottom of your solution. And after that 24 hour period, 
you'll want to make sure to try not to disturb the solution as much as possible, but you're going to want to slowly pour. I'll bring these back into the frame here. You're going to want to slowly pour that alcohol solution with your sludge and your coagulated fats and lipids. It's in here. It's going to be cold, so you need to wear cold gloves. You're going to want to pour it all the way through your Buchner funnel and use a vacuum to help assist. Okay. Now the vacuum pump I recommend using is going to be a pump like this. This is a diaphragm vacuum pump. Okay. It has two diaphragms on top and they pump basically like lungs, kind of, and they do suction. They suck, they help suck through the filter, that fat and those lipids, I mean all the, uh, the, the, the oil and the liquid, but keep the fats and the lipids stuck behind on the filter. Okay, and it's gonna be a slow process. This isn't something that happens very fast. It's like making coffee, and in fact, I like to use these unbleached coffee filters, and I'll stick them inside, and I'll make a little pocket and I'll pour my solution into my coffee filter, unbleached coffee filter. And basically this makes it so that when there's fats and lipids that build up in this filter, I can take this coffee filter out, throw it away and put a new filter in here and it doesn't get very clogged. It saves this from getting really clogged during the process. So adding a little filter in there will help you can pull it out change it out and it'll speed up the process for the overall filtration. Now that Buchner funnel is just one of many devices you can use for filtration. Um, there's all sorts of different stainless steel options, there's, um, there's porcelain filters, there's very large surface area ones, there's skinny small glass ones like you saw, you saw there. That's for more of a small, you know, setup. That, that'll, that'll do two liters in a, in a couple hours. It takes, it takes a while. It took me maybe, maybe two hours or so to filter that product. It's slow. But what you're left with after all that fat solidify is this. All these impurities were inside of this crude oil. Lots and lots of impurities. This is something the consumer would be smoking. Oops, let me switch the camera here. We do this one. So this is what the consumer would be smoking if you don't do a winterizing process. It's also what would be inside this flask if you weren't filtering it out first, which would make it very hard to distill. So winterizing is so crucial, you guys. Winterizing is one of the most important steps prior to distillation. The starter kit, uh, Christina is asking, does the starter kit come with a Buchner funnel? It does not come with a Buchner funnel. It is strictly for the distillation kit. Filtration is a whole process that needs to happen before distillation. Now you can get away with not filtering, okay? If I chose not to filter today, it would make this much more work. Okay, it says it's good. It says we're live again. I'll just give it a minute to kind of get back up in action here, make sure that it is indeed rolling. There we go. I apologize for that. I'm not sure what ended up happening there, but it looks like we had an interruption in the internet service. But we should be back in action and ready to go. Now, I'm not sure where we left off, uh, what, what you guys might have missed, but we were just finishing talking about winterization and the importance of winterization. Um, and the next thing we were going to get into was setup of the glassware. And I uh, want to just talk about one, one thing that you're going to need to do before you actually set up is you're going to need, need to make sure, we talked about this in the accessories, is you're going to need to make sure to use some uh, vacuum grease. Some, this is high Dow Corning, high vacuum grease. I'm going to use a little dollop on the edge of my finger. And I'm going to go through and I want to make sure to vacuum grease up all of the joints we're going to be using. I'll be a little liberal. Don't, don't be too scared to use too much. The only thing I will say, and we'll talk about it on some other joints, is where you grease it. 
So I'm going to get in here, I grease the joint, slide it up, and I'm going to turn it back and forth to make sure that the grease works its way in. Okay. Now here's where I want you guys to be aware is the grease on these joints and on any of the joints that are going to be in the pathway of the distillation or close to the distillate. You want to make sure not to grease the entirety of the joint. I don't want to grease all the way from the top all the way down to the bottom. What I do want to do is just grease the first half, okay? And you'll see, oops, I'll show you. I'm going to go down about halfway, and I'm going to do it on each side of the joint. I'm not going to just do it on one side. I go around each, like two or three sides of the joint and put some grease on there. Here we go, halfway down, be liberal, halfway down, be liberal. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to connect all of my glass flasks to the end of these joints. And a good practice is to make sure that before you use any of your glassware, you tear it out. So here, I have my tear weights on the flask. You can see this one's 144 grams. I'm going to stick this on, and I'm going to rotate back and forth. Now I'm going to show you guys a close-up of the joint. Can you see how it's clear about halfway through the joint? Okay. I'm going to put the next flask on so you guys can see it. Slide this flask on. And when I slide it on, I'm going to make sure to rotate back and forth until I see a nice clear band. Ryan says I'm unable to hear or see anything. I'm not sure what to do. I guess I'll wait for the DVD. Ryan. Ryan, can you hear me in the chat room here on Google Hangouts when I unmute myself? Just give me a yes or no. We'll try to help you. Okay, so it's your YouTube. For some reason, when you click the YouTube link, what happens? Are you getting to a page? See, I'm going to use my clips here. Oops, I just dropped it behind my desk over here. Just dropped it again. Here we go. I'm going to clip it on. Make sure all my joints stay together, okay? Now I got all three of these balls, or these flasks collected, connected, excuse me. I'm going to set that off to the side because that's all prepared. Next I'm going to grab my distillation head. I'll give you guys a shot of this. I put it in. Again, be liberal, but only go halfway down the joint when you're doing this. Because the reason I say that is when you put this together and it heats up, you don't want grease dripping down into your flask, or you don't want it collecting in your collection flask. You want to make sure that you don't feel any grinding of the glass on glass when you put the grease together. You want it to be nice and smooth, buttery smooth, if you will. Here, I'm going to use that metal clip on that joint to make sure that it doesn't melt. I have another metal clip. Where did I put it? Is it over here? Where did I set that other metal clip? I think I put it back here. There we go. So I have another metal clip for the thermometer probe. 
That one's going to go right here on this one. And, oh, actually, I did not grease up the thermometer probe yet. It was just in there from when I did the alcohol. So I got to still grease this joint up. Take this probe out. You really got to be careful and analyzing which things you have greased and haven't greased because one small ungreased joint could mean the reason for your vacuum leak or could mean the reason for your high boiling temperatures. So be aware. Move this back and forth to make sure the work to grease in all the way around the joint. Okay. Make sure it's tightened down. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the top of my distillation head. Normally you can st stick a thermometer in this head here like I described, but for today, and actually for my preference, I don't like to per th put a thermometer in the top of the distillation head. And I'll tell you why. It causes more problems than it crea creates solutions. So more often than not, the I see the vacuum leak happen right here anytime it is. It's because we're trying to use, like you see with this thermometer joint over here, we're trying to screw tight around the outside of this a nice tight seal. And sometimes these little joints are not the easiest part to seal. The, this little green cap is the hardest point to seal these thermometers. So that's where all your leaks will occur. So if I can, I remove the, all, the, all the potential leak failure points and I keep all in what I need. I, I have to have that thermometer in there for the mantle. So that's my one weakness in the connections. Other than that, these glass joints are pretty secure. All right, last thing's gonna get together here is the distillation head and the flasks. I'm gonna grease up this joint pretty good. And I'm gonna come in with my cow or my pig here. This is the pig. And I'm gonna connect it to my distillation head. Being very careful when I do this, you guys. Don't put any tension on the distillation head. Slide it over real careful. Wiggle it back and forth. Make sure work that grease in really good. Got a good joint now. And then safely put it down on your stand. I have a jack stand here, which we'll be able to see today throughout the process. Make this a little bit better. So you can see as we're distilling throughout today, you'll be able to see the flasks and as I rotate them, you guys can see that as well. Let's do this, let's move. Here, I got one more joint to put a cut clip on here. Being careful when I do this. Okay, now all my joints are securely greased. Both my flask joints here are greased. My distillation head, my thermometer probe, penny stopper, all three flasks, my cold trap, everything is greased up. So I know that all my connections should be good now. I'm gonna take off my gloves. It's always good to wear gloves when you're doing the greasing portion because that stuff is nasty. It gets all over the place. And before uh, I actually start, I need to hook up another piece of hose, which I'll do quickly. So I'm going to connect up my distillation head to my cold trap here. I'm going to take my GL connections here, which you can kind of see me off the side doing. Hooking up my hose to my cold trap. And then my hose to the end of my pig receiver here. As you can see here. So I'm using these GL14 connections, which just unscrew, and I'll just stick the hose barb in here, making sure to get it nice and deep on the hose barb and we'll screw together that connection making sure it holds a nice tight seal all right now 
Our glassware is completely assembled. Distillation kit is assembled with the glassware. The next thing I need to do is I have a cold trap over here. This cold trap is half fill of alcohol. And what I'm gonna need to do is fill that cold trap with some dry ice. Uh, let's see. I have some dry ice here set off in a cooler on the side, which I'm going to take and grab a cup real quick because I don't want to grab that dry ice with anything else. Dry ice will burn your hands. Ask me how I know. Yes, I've burnt my hands on dry ice more than once. Okay, so I'm going to take a, I have a Pyrex. Um, Oop here. And I'm gonna be careful about this because there's already alcohol in here. It's gonna it's gonna kind of shoot up. It's gonna get cold. You can see right away it's starting to bubble. And I need to cool down that alcohol first. It's really warm. It's been sitting in there. Oh. Okay, be careful. Now I got alcohol kind of coming over the top, just a little bit. It's okay. That's why I have that little dish below also to catch any alcohol spilling. See if I could show you this here close up. Let's see, I'll give you a shot of the cold trap. So you guys can see that cold trap is quite active because there's alcohol in there and I'm putting dry ice in her. That dry ice is volatile. It wants to make gas right away. That's why it's Got the CO2 pouring over the top. So you want to make sure that when you do this process also, you're in a well-ventilated space. Today we are. Or if you can, work under a fume hood. Most laboratory environments or regulated environments are going to have that for you. Okay. Slowly filling up this cold trap here. We're getting there. Put a little bit too much alcohol in here yesterday and I was didn't want to empty it so I said uh eh, we'll make do. Normally don't need a whole lot of alcohol in here just enough to create the idea is that we're trying to create enough surface contact. If I just put dry ice in this cold trap by itself then ice only touches points of the glassware and if you put a liquid in here like alcohol well then you're creating a full contact with the inside walls. So that's why we use the dry ice and alcohol combination. So our cold trap is almost full. Let's keep filling it slowly here. Careful not to overdo it. Almost there. And as it cools down, you're gonna really start seeing that alcohol get kind of sludgy. It really starts to cool down quick. Okay, so we're full about now. Now that we're full, I have some little cork caps. Our kit comes with a glass one. I just didn't have one for this one, but I have a, a cork on top here to kind of help preserve any of the CO2 gases that are trying to escape. It'll help keep my cold trap holding that ice a little bit longer. Because if I don't, if I just leave it uncapped, it'll just evaporate faster. So cap it off to help things out. All right. So next thing is I need to hook up my distillation head. I have my recirculator here. And I have a couple lines coming from my heater. I'm going to have the outlet feeding into the bottom so that we fill from the bottom of the distillation column to the top. We want to flood it and you guys will see that when I turn it on here. It'll make sense why we do that. I'll give you a close up when I do flip it on here. So I screwed all my connections to my distillation head. I'll give you a more close up view as I turn on the... Let's see if I can do this. All right. There's a close up of the condenser. Now what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to turn on the recirculator. 
and you'll see that it's filling from the bottom and exiting out the top. That's important. If you don't exit or if, or if you don't fill from the bottom, it's just going to create kind of like a waterfall. It won't completely uh, it won't completely fill the jacket. It'll just slowly trickle down. You want to fill the jacket with water. Water. You want to push all the air out of there. So filling from the bottom is how you're going to get that. John Ross asking a good question. He's asking about the vacuum pump. Sorry, I didn't see this earlier. He was asking if the vacuum pump actually needs to be on the same level surface as the equipment. No, not at all, John. In fact, commonly you're going to see the vacuum underneath the table. Same with the chillers. Most time the chiller and the vacuum are going to go underneath the table. I just wanted you guys to be able to see today everything kind of being used. Now I'm going to enable a couple of features on the screen here. And let me do this real quick. Let's do this. All right, so I've added a couple of extra details overlaid onto the window. These are going to be on throughout the rest of the feed or the rest of the stream. These will help you guys see exactly the temperatures um, that we're working with on each one of the units in the background. I know it's a little blurry, but I'm zoomed in as far as I can zoom in on them from the distance I'm at. And essentially what you're going to get here is the one up here. This is going to be your bath temperature. So you can see the temperature is at 31.2 degrees Celsius and slowly climbing right now. I have the set point right below. It's going to be set to 60 degrees Celsius for today. You really need this to be warm. You really want your condenser to be warm. So 60 degrees Celsius on the condenser should do sufficient for today. If we find we'll need to turn it up, uh, meaning that if the oil is slowly going through the condenser, uh, too goopy, too heavy like a molasses, then we'll turn up the temperatures. But 60 degrees Celsius I find is a good, good happy medium. It'll get us uh, flowing consistently into our collection flask by keeping it warm enough. Now the temperature down here, up in this area of the window, is going to be your heating mantle temperature. So you can see it's at 29 degrees right now. All right. So this is our starting point. We're all set up. We got our glassware assembled. We have our heater hooked up and set to 60 degrees Celsius again. Everything we're going to be talking about today is in Celsius unless otherwise stated as Fahrenheit. Get used to using liters, milliliters, Celsius. Uh, get used to the uh, metric system. Okay, um, so now that we have everything good, we have our dry ice and our coal trap, our greased joints, we have all of our vacuum connections hooked up, we have our chiller, or not our chiller, excuse me, our heater running at full temperature. 60 degrees Celsius set point and we're slowly reaching that point. Uh, the next thing is I will show you a couple of tricks. So let's do this. Now you'll notice the flask is pretty empty right now and open. In the future we will be using, well actually I'll just do it now and if you guys want I can show you guys a close-up view of the flask while we run. But I'm gonna wrap my flask exposed top half because it is exposed to the room's environment, so it's going to actually cool down the flask if it's not insulated at all. So we're just going to help things out by insulating it with this fiberglass rope, which is also included in our accessories kit. So we're going to wrap this fiberglass rope around this flask to help insulate the top portion. This fiberglass rope is can take a lot of heat. It won't burn, it won't smoke, it won't make any smell. It's the same stuff you use around a fireplace uh, seal or an oven seal. Okay, so we've insulated our flask a bit and uh, we'll be able to kind of show you guys throughout the process. I'll be able to peek over and show you guys what it looks like in there. But for now, I'm going to point it at the distillation head and top half of the flask. And let's start to be, let's start everything. So um, first things first, I'm going to kick on my vacuum pump. We're going to run this full bore the entire time. There's no regulation on the vacuum. So it's just as simple as turning all these devices on full power. Okay, our vacuum pump is on. 
And now the real demonstration is going to begin. We're officially set up, we're officially under vacuum, and now we can start applying heat and really start getting into the distillation process. So to begin, before you get into distillation, you're going to need to remove all alcohol from the winterizing process. Alcohol is going to be remaining because obviously we had to dilute it in some alcohol in order to get things winterized. After winterization, you need to remove that alcohol. That is where a rotary evaporator comes very handy. Most laboratories will use a rotary evaporator. It, uh, it removes solvent pretty effectively and at low temperatures under vacuum. You can also get rid of any alcohol in a system like this. You can use this distillation apparatus to, oops, excuse me, I'm on the close-up one. You can use you can use a short path distillation to do the alcohol evaporation. It's not really effective. It really is not. And the reason why is this condenser is too short. Alcohols will skip right past that condenser and go into your cold trap. The idea is we want to heat up our vapor out of this flask. We want to distill it through our column and we want to immediately collect it right out of this distillation head. And if our condenser is not cold enough or is not long enough in length, well then the gases or vapors will travel right past the condenser and into our cold trap, effectively circumventing what we want. We're trying to condense distillates. So alcohol will work in here. Just I wouldn't recommend using much alcohol if you can. Do small amount of volumes. Um, it's common to transfer out of a rotary evapor uh, evaporator into one of these flasks after you're done getting a bulk of the alcohol out. You'll take it and it'll still be a little bit runny. You pour it out of the rotary evaporator into this flask with a small amount of alcohol in it. Maybe 100-200 milliliters. Then you can distill that alcohol into your cold trap, no problem. Uh, but I would be careful. I say be careful because alcohol will impact your oil in your, in your pump. Our vacuum pumps are using oil to seal them and if you don't, uh, or if you have volatile mixtures inside the oil of the vacuum pump, it's like having a bunch of bu bubbles inside the oil. It doesn't create a good seal um, and it can impact your vacuum levels. So alcohols with a rotary vapor pump are not the best. That's why we recommend using a rotary evaporator with like a diaphragm pump, something separate for alcohol recovery. All right, so what I've gone ahead and done is flipped on the switch for the vacuum, and the next thing I'm doing is heating up my mixture. You can see the temperature range is starting to increase on our heating mantle. Just jumped up another degree. We were at 20-something uh, degrees. Now we're at 31 and climbing, 32. If I look at the set point, it's set to 67 right now, or let's just turn it up to like 75. Essentially what I'm trying to do is just get things warmed up. I'm getting, the, I'm getting the oil itself warmed up so that it can begin to stir. So just going to about 75 degrees Celsius under full vacuum uh, will help warm up the product to get to our starting point. Christina is asking me what type of alcohol would we use, uh, what ethanol, percent or proof you want to use 190 proof at minimum if you can use 200 proof alcohol it's commonly available now in fact I would recommend that you look for denatured with heptane or other methods um, because alcohol pure ethanol by itself is very expensive it has a tax uh, there's an excise tax included in alcohol which can be very costly Nowadays, they have denatured versions of ethanol that will cost much less with no tax, um, and they're essentially 190 proof with a little bit of heptane, which is okay. All right, so now that I'm heating up, uh, I'm going to start stirring the product, and I'm going to show you guys, because right away, 
The flask itself is starting to bubble in there. And you can see it's spit up a little bit of oil on the outside of the flask walls here. It's a little bit of oil sputtered up. Basically, it tells me it's going through some volatile compounds in there, maybe some water. I assume that's probably what's left in here is water content. Now, I didn't mention this, and I'm going to mention this now, just realizing this. Uh, our starting flasks. Notice that I want to start on one end or the other. I don't want to start on the middle flask. I want to start on the furthest one, go to the middle one, and then go to the end as I rotate. So I'm just making sure that it was on the end flask there. All right, so we've reached our set point very quickly. I set my temperature to 75 degrees, and you guys can see at the bottom. We are starting to slightly overshoot that, which is okay. The heating mantle will slightly overshoot. Uh, it, it's no longer heating, so it's going to be cooling down a little bit. But what you'll notice is that the head, the distillation head, if I can get a little bit closer up on it, you're starting to see a little bit of yellow color right at the indentation of the Vigro. Can you guys see that? So you can see there's a little bit of color coming into the distillation head. And at this temperature, around 70, 80 degrees, what, would I, what I expect at this point is I know there's no more alcohol left in this solution. I removed it before class. I did this the other day. And removed uh, most of the alcohol, if not all of it. So I wouldn't see any alcohol at this point. I'm at 87 degrees Celsius, and the boiling point of water at one atmosphere is 100 degrees Celsius, or 99.97 degrees Celsius. So under vacuum, reducing the pressure at 88, we're seeing water starting to evaporate right now. Of course, when you do an extraction of plant material, there's going to be a little bit of moisture, most likely, in those leaves or in the plant cells. And that, that moisture is going to be extracted as well as the oils and any impurities. Christina is saying, I have denatured 200 proof alcohol. She's saying it has 1.39% ethyl acetate, 3.71% methanol, 0.54% heptane, and 1.35% methyl isobutanol ketone. This is, I believe, um, where did you get that from, if you don't mind me asking? Because I do believe that is an okay uh, denatured solvent. Uh, sounds like you, you guys have done a little bit of research already. Uh, I need to double check on that specific mi mixture, but from what I'm reading there, everything does sound pretty good. Uh, you want to make sure that everything has a boiling point uh, relative enough that you can remove it during a distillation process and that there's not going to be any, any methylated spirits remaining um, that might have a higher boiling point. So you got to be conscious of that and I'm pretty sure that al alcohol you have would be, would be suitable. All right, so I've reached my boiling point. I'm going to exceed the boiling point a little bit now. We're at 90 degrees Celsius. I'm going to bump it up to 125 degrees Celsius. We're going to do this in stages. And the reason I want to do this is in stages is I want to see if any sort of volatiles come off on these earlier temperatures. We're really not going to start seeing any sort of extraction or distillate coming across in regards to um, terpenes until maybe around 140, 130 to 190 degrees Celsius, you're going to see terpenes coming off. So I'm just really kind of getting up before my terpenes start introducing. I'm at 125 degrees Celsius. This is just above the boiling point of water. 
So I want to make sure, my first, my first thing is I want to get all the water out. So I'm at 125 degrees Celsius. This is above the boiling point of water at atmospheric pressure. So under vacuum, it's got to be removed. And this is just before any sort of terpenes start getting introduced into the distillation pathway. So 125 degrees is a good point to kind of get to before you really start seeing any sort of activity collecting in your flasks over here. Now I do see in the coal trap, I'll try to get you guys a shot here, if I can. So here's our coal trap on the right hand side and notice that it is collecting drips. You guys see that? We're at 90 degrees Celsius and we're collecting inside of our coal trap contents of a clear liquid. I would safely assume that that is both alcohol and water or what's better known as an azeotrope. Water and ethanol create an azeotrope around 94%. So I'm assuming that right now, just based on my experience, that that is water and alcohol coming across into our cold trap. So since there is alcohol inside this, um, the warm temperatures, you can see it's cold underneath here because it's actually evaporating. The ice underneath is actually evaporating because it's under vacuum. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour some alcohol, I'm sorry, some ice, not alcohol, underneath this flask. You guys can see this. This is my cold trap now. And there's a little bit of alcohol in that dish from when it spilled over. Kind of like a little catch, catch all caught all of it. Okay, so I got a good amount of ice underneath. It's contacting the bottom surface of the glass. If I need to, I can lower everything down into it. I think we're good. And now what that's going to do is preserve my vacuum even a little bit more. Because now that alcohol that's in there won't try to, won't try to evaporate. It's not going to try to evaporate because it's cold. It's being cooled down. And so it's going to stop my vacuum pump from having to keep up with that constant evaporation change. All right. So our temperatures are now moving up. You guys notice that the temperature is um, over here, my, my water bath. The temperature on this water bath is at 60 degrees Celsius. So we've reached our set point here. If I look down here, we're over that 90 degree point now and climbing. And if I look, I'm really seeing, let me give you a better shot here. Can you see this? In my cow, do you see the amount of smoke in there? It's not smoke, it's actually water vapor. Can you guys see that? I'll give you a... So right now, we're definitely seeing all the vapors of the, the water content being escaping out of the system right now. Let's see if I can get you another shot here. Can you see this? So if you see this kind of smoke appearance early on around 120 degrees Celsius, you're looking at all this moisture and volatiles escaping out of the system. Now if I look at my flask, let's come over here, get you guys a good shot close up. See that reaction going on. And I'm going to look at my stir bar and make sure we're stirring good. I'm going to kick it up a, lot, a notch if I need to. And now look at my mantle temperatures. 
We've reached our set point of 125. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to kick it up a notch again. Now we're going to go up in a little bit slighter increments here. We're going to probably go to 165. So you guys can see that on the mantle. I have it set at 165. That's my set point. Hit the button again. It's at 130. And we're just going to slowly keep climbing here and we're going to pay attention to the reaction going on in the distillation head and in the flask. So at this point, we're just kind of watching temperatures and on cruise control. We're going to keep bumping things up and we, we really should start seeing a true reaction of cannabinoids around 205 degrees Celsius, maybe just before then, all the way into the 220s or 230 ranges, depending on how much impurities are in here. So we're only at about 130 right now, which is still earlier than what we're expecting. So we still got some, uh, some work some worm, some room to work through. And also, you're going to notice that once you start getting through that water vapor stage, you're going to notice that the indentation on the Vigro column is going to start receding. This is where we're at here. You can see earlier it was a little bit browner and darker. That was because the water content was carrying over some of those impurities and that cannabinoids with it. And the theoretical plating was doing its job. It was condensing any non-volatile mixture on the theoretical plates and causing it to reflux, which we're starting to see happen. We're starting to see liquid falling back down into the flask as temperatures are working up through. And if I point it down even a little bit more, in this joint area, if you look closely, you should start seeing the drips starting to fall back down into the flask a little bit, the rejection. This is the beginning stages of reflux. You're really going to notice it when the Vigro column starts to condense liquid and reject. But right now we're really kind of seeing it in the joint mainly, right here in the connection period. All this added jointry and the flaring out of the joint causes some additional surface area. That's why you start seeing the reactions happening here first in the joint. And I see the yellow really starting to pop in, you guys. Can you see that yellow color? Yep, we're getting to the point where I'm really liking it. We're starting to get to terpene stage. We're starting to get to that point where we're building vapor pressure underneath with the volatiles as we heat them up. They're filling this area in the flask, but there's still not quite enough pressure to make it up through the distillation column, okay? We st we're still kind of from here down at this point in the head. We still haven't built enough vapor pressure to make it up over. And now, if I get close on the head, do you guys see this reaction starting to form? This is a good sign. Actually, this is a really good sign. I'm actually starting to see terpenes collecting. So I'm going to show you guys can see this little pitter-patter action going on. You see this? That's vapor pressure being generated from the flask going up the distillation column, okay? Starting to work its way up through the column. And you'll notice this pittering, this pitter-patter butterfly effect traveling up, 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 up. It'll slowly make its way to the top of the column, which actually it's there now. So let me take a further step out. See if I can show you guys a close up view. I'm 
Okay. We're getting somewhere. It's actually going very smooth for a distillation run. I gotta be honest. I'm thinking that today's material is gonna turn out pretty good. So now if I get closer onto the flask and I show you guys the collection flask on this end of the system, you're gonna notice that we're collecting. We're starting our fraction. So what did I tell you? We're at 165 degrees Celsius and we're seeing terpenes and volatile compounds from the mixture making it over. This is just what we want to see right now. We're per everything is going very smoothly. The rate of distillation is nice and smooth and steady. If I look at my distillation head section, for the most part, we're getting to the point where almost everything at 160 is coming through, all the terpenes. But you can see on the output feed, obviously there's still a collection going on. So we're just going to continue sitting here at this temperature. There's no need to really increase things too much. Actually, you know what, I am going to bump it up a little bit because if you look at the distillation head up close, look at that reaction. There's really no reaction going on. So I want to start building vapor pressure in that column, so I am going to bump it up a little bit. I'm going to go to about 185. Oh, not too much, 20 degree bump maybe 10 to 20 degrees Celsius bump at a time. Watch the reaction, see how things are, are, are handling it, and back off if necessary. For anyone curious, my stir bar feature on the magnetic stir bar is pretty much at maximum. I'm trying to keep this product spinning and rotating at all times. I don't want it sitting stagnant on the bottom, scorching the material at all. So things are going really well, really smooth, I would say. Let me turn this. Sorry, I didn't set it. There we go. Things are going very smooth. I think that today's run is probably going to end up a nice result, just considering how things are going so far. No real issues. Again, you can see we're just sitting at a constant 60 degrees Celsius for our heater bath and just slowly working up our temperatures in increments of about 20 degrees at a time. Early, be, at the beginning, I started at 75. I went from 75 to 125, from 125 to 165, from 165 to 185, and from here on out, I'm going to keep going in increments, but I'm going to keep getting them smaller and smaller because as I get towards one, uh, 200 degrees Celsius, I know I'm getting closer to the target zone of our distillation. I don't want to overshoot too much. I only need as much heat as possible in order to distill this product. So our collection is really slowed down on the output feed you guys can see this flask is pretty much slowed to a very slow steady drip tells me we we're working through pretty much most of those terpenes in there within that within that fraction of temperature at least and it's still trying to work up in temperature and actually I'm seeing a little bit more I do see it distilling now, a pretty good, consistent feed.
show you a little bit down on the column in this range. You can really start to see that it's building some vapor pressure, but not quite enough to get it to kick up over. So there's, those are the cannabinoids there, falling back down. Not quite ready. So we'll just let this continue here. There's really not much you can do at this point, but wait. Our temperature did reach 185, so I'm gonna bounce it up again a little bit more to maybe 195. We're gonna go 10 in increments of 10 on this one. 195 set, 185 current. We're gonna heat things up a little bit. It's getting going to get exciting here soon, you guys. We're almost getting to that THC fraction. We're only at uh, about 20 degrees away. Now, you can see from this view that reflux really happening right now. You can see the dripping just consistently going back down into the flax. So it's just an indicator that we need to keep bumping temperatures up a little bit at a time. Building the vapor pressure necessary through temperature. Our output feed is definitely slowing to a once every second or so drip, maybe every just under a second. And I noticed too, you'll also see that our temperature of our heating mantle is pretty staying relatively consistent. It just went up to 189, but it was at 187, 188 here for a couple minutes. It hasn't. It's been unable to get up to 195 in temperature. So what that's telling me is that we have evaporation happening at this point. It's evaporatively cooling that solution. So it's fighting to try and reach above that temperature. But it cannot go above 189, 190 at this point because there's vapor still evaporating as we speak. So it's fighting the temperature raise and increase right now. And you can see that. Tells me we're working through a fraction right now for sure. And I can see it because we're collecting on the output a small fraction. But we are slowly making it through. I'm starting to see the column here get a little bit thicker in, in consistency. Just paying attention to it. Starting to get a little bit more of a thick viscosity. All right, so we're at 193, slowly still trying to reach 195. I set that 195 quite a bit ago, and it's just slowly trying to work its way through it. If I look at the distillation head, I definitely see the condenser 
See if I can do this. I can definitely see the condenser has color in it. All the way up is a yellow strip going all the way down the condenser. And if, oh, here we go. I'm starting to see some thickening of the viscosity. And I'll show you where to look for it, too. So I'm going to switch to this camera angle here at the flask. And I'm going to try to get it in so you guys can see. If you watch the back side of the cow, it's kind of hard to see here because there's vapors condensed in here. But if you watch the back side of the cow, you can start to see the distillate dripping into the flask here. And you can see when it drips into the flask, you can see that it ripples into the liquid. It's not, it's very viscous. It's very viscous. It's not thick at all. You're going to watch the consistency of this product dripping um, to also identify cannabinoids. Look at that temperature, you guys. It's dropping a little bit. We're at 192. My set point is 195 right now. It's having a hard time reaching it. So I'm going to give her a little bit more heat, a little bit more encouragement to try and work through that phase. I'm going to go to 200, and hopefully that keeps the power on for a little bit longer period of time. Help try to work up through that temperature zone, zone there. Yeah, we're getting there, folks. There's another indicator. Another indicator is watching the flask, okay? You're going to watch the outside of this flask, and when you start getting more towards the, the THC fraction, you're going to start seeing it, quote-unquote, rain inside the flask is what I like to call it. You can see the inside of this flask is just, it's like it's raining inside there. The oil is slowly coating the top of it and raining down back into the flask. Our reflux is most certainly picking up. If I start traveling up the column, we're at this zone right here where we're trying to reach through the head. I can see where it's at. The vapor pressure is really trying to struggle to get up into this head right here. And that's because that temperature is at 193 and it's, we're going through a fraction of terpenes. It will not go any higher. No matter what we do, we can keep adding more heat, but the temperature is going to be, remain constant. Our system right now is isothermal. This is an isothermal unit right now. The vapor pressure and the temperature are not, change, not, not changing. They're staying consistent. And our temperatures are staying, remaining constant because of the evaporative theory. The evaporation is cooling down the liquid consistently at the same rate the heat is being applied. Now we're at 195. Seems like we might start, start to generate some pressure here, starting to build some pressure up to the column maybe. And yes, we are because it's moving a little bit up the column. I'll give you a closer zoom. Now we're into the Vigros. You can see. And our temperatures are slowly rising. So pay attention to the temperature up on the top right hand corner at 196. And pay attention to this column. And as this slowly increases one temperature degree at a time, you're going to start seeing this fluttering effect slowly raised through this column here. After about 200 degrees Celsius, you're, we're really going to get close into that territory of starting to see cannabinoids. Yes, sir. 
198, you guys can see. All right, see, I'm gonna give it a little bit more encouragement. We're gonna go to 210. And I suspect it's definitely going to have a hard time working up to 210, but we'll see where she goes. She's working her magic. She's getting there. It's important that you work through this very slowly. Well, not too rapidly, I should say. Not slowly, but not too rapid, uh, because you want to make sure that you're not overshooting temperatures when it comes to distillation. Uh, that'll cause you to, to degrade the product, as we've spoken about numerous times. Let's see, you got this view here. You can start to see that ring of oil and vapor pressure really pushing up. It's almost like it's completely blocking the pathway with oil, and it, it is. It's just kind of hovering there, that oil. Slowly going to make its way up. We're at 199, about to cross that 200 threshold. And it's starting to spit up just a little bit into the vigros. And we're at 200. And you're starting to see the vigro indentation really start to get active now. This is where we need to be watching our temperatures and watching our oil because we're about to switch into our oil fraction here, our cannabinoid fraction. As this works up the column, and as, as, as it reaches literally, let me go here, as it starts to begin to travel up, 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 it's, it's going to work slowly, 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 and as soon as it gets to the top point here, it will literally, like a waterfall, start flooding over pretty rapidly. You will start to see the change to cannabinoids and it's at this point where we're going to do our first flask rotation. We need to be paying attention at all times during this this temperature range here of 204. This is where we're going to really start seeing it happen coming soon. In fact, I really wish you guys could see this. I'm going to try to get a, a shot for you. So this camera here, can you see the dripping on the back side of this flask? Do you see the consistency dripping? Do you see how it's turning into a thicker oil-like consistency? It's starting to pick up speed here. If I look back at our column, close up, you're really seeing it work through. I always like to let this process of uh, the switching of the flask here, the rotating of the flask, you got to be careful not to rotate too early. Um, at this point in time, you know, I might get away with rotating the flask. I'd say it's a little premature to rotate the flask. What I really like to do is I will wait until this flask here collects at least maybe a gram or two of very thick distillate. I've clearly worked through my fraction point on any terpenes and at this point I'm kind of just want to make sure that I, I clean out through the head. I, I clear the pathway of any sort of contaminants and then I'll run just one or two grams of distillate into this first flask and then I'll start rotating right after that.
We're at 208. I'm gonna bump my temperature up just a little bit more, 215. 212 degrees is like a magical number for me. I always find my distillations hitting 212. I don't know why, it is the magic number. Um, it must be the boiling point under the vacuum levels we achieve. And if you get a good filtering, 212 tends to be like the magic number. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to rotate our flasks because if I look at the distillation head, I'm going to show you a close up. I really have good reaction here in the Vigros. If I look all the way up the column, I'm seeing a reaction slowly all the way up to the top. My distillate has definitely reached the top. My output, I'm seeing a thick distillation stream starting to run. It is really starting to come out now, almost to the point where it's a stream. So before it begins to really start running out, I'm going to rotate in preparation for that. And I'll take a, a view of the whole area here and show you what it looks like to rotate a flask, okay? I'm going to lean up just a little bit. I'm going to take my flask. I'm going to rotate carefully. And I'm going to set it down right back in place. Now that was all done under vacuum. And there we go. We're pretty much on a roll. If I look at my output, I'm going to try and get a, a shot for you guys because this is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. It's looking fantastic, you guys. Like the product here is stellar. I'm going to try to show you guys this output stream. Can you see this? This is what you want to see. Can you see the rate at that? It's flowing out of there. Now look at my distillation head. I'm going to give you a close up so we can do a slow pan up of it. So look at the flask, it's looking consistent. Good vapor pressure up the column. Perfect flutter going on in the theoretical plating. Here is where the fractionating column is doing all of its magic. And if I pull out a little bit wider view, you can really see it doing the magic here. This is the magic of the fractionating column. It's beautiful. Watching this liquid condense on these theoretical plates. And you can actually, if you look really closely, you can see the different rings. There's two separate rings hovering right next to each other. And there's actually a third ring, if I zoom out, down here. If we add more rings, we create more stages of theoretical plating. And the potency of this ring is slightly less than the potency of this ring and so forth if I add more column packing. But the more column packing means the longer this oil will stay in this tube, hot. This is the hottest point at the distillation. It's where the vapors are at its saturated temperature. And we don't want to oversaturate the vapors at that temperature. Now let's fl flip to our flask on the output and take a look at what it looks like when you get into a full stream here. Let me try and, let's see. You can't really see it because the flask has got the, the, the name in the front. I'll rotate the flask. But can you see the output here? I'll get a little closer for you. It's collecting like honey on the output. Okay. So there she is. That is pretty much the part of the distillation right here this is where we're at we're, we hit a home run pretty much we're, we're at the point where once you hit this fraction notice my temperature 215 not going anywhere up from here we're fine we don't need to go any higher we have plenty enough of a reaction in fact 
if we go any hotter, that reaction can start to spit up too high. We'll start to see this reaction spit over the distillation column, and it'll start to throw distillate into the, into the uh, condenser, which we really want to try to avoid. We really want only vapors condensing. So if we really want, I can back off my stir bar, and I'm going to show you what it looks like when I do that. Try to reduce the reaction a little bit, pull it down. And if I speed it up, you can see it does jump the reaction a little bit more. Temperature in your stir bar can really help control that reaction and the rate. You really want to try and agitate that liquid mixture as much as possible to create as much surface area. Um, and then the temperature can help speed the process up. Now also pay attention to the color here in the distillation rings, the two distillation purity rings I like to call them. Just keep an eye on those throughout the, the process. This is where your eagle eye is really going to come into play when it comes to distillation. The more times you're going to be doing this process, the better you're all, you are going to be able to tell the output color and purity uh, of your product. Um, you're going to want to watch this change shades of color. If it, starts, if it starts to darken up, which it will at some point, you're going to want to rotate your flask because you don't want to do all this great work, all this time spent to get this very beautiful, you know, yellow looking output and to have it change shades on you slowly throughout the process and then you end up with an orange or a red mixture inside this beautiful yellow. It will start to turn a little bit darker in color. That's because your bottom flask, your main flask, is going to be coming or is going to be increasing in concentration of impurities over time because we're distilling and taking out some of the good stuff. This starts getting worse and worse over time. So it really starts to get like sludge. By the end of it, you will pretty much have a black goop inside their flask with a bunch of sludge and maybe one or two or three percent THC. So you got to be conscious of the color changing over time and the impurities starting to boil over. Looking at my output, it is beautiful. Uh, I have a consistent steady stream coming into my flask. We're getting a good rate of flow here. My distillation head is nice and active. If I was in a regulated environment and I needed to do other work at this point in time, I would feel confident walking around the lab, handling other priorities, and checking in on this unit. And with modern technology, they have a lot of devices that you can actually hook up to these units and monitor these temperature ranges. So if, for instance, you overshoot 216 degrees, you can set an alarm. Or if the temperature drops to below 214 degrees, you can set an alarm and have it alert you. So you can walk back over to your machine and say, why did my temperature drop a couple degrees? Or why did my temperature increase? Well, maybe I finished a boiling point or a fraction. So maybe it's increasing at that point. So you can set these basically automated, come back and check in on your machines with a lot of modern technology they have for distillation. So I'm just going to add a little more ice to my cold trap. There's not really anything going on here in the cold trap, but it's good to top it up throughout the run. The, the cold trap is what really protects your vacuum level, makes it the most efficient it can be. So when you check it in on your cold trap, just making sure she's running smooth. Holy moly, this output is really kicking butt right now. I want to show you guys. This output is really kicking butt. It's just oozing out of the tip like it's a tree sap or something. This is what you want to see.
And look at the color. I always like to make a note of this for anybody starting this because I know a lot of you guys out there are looking for distillates and to add to your product line. And I want to make a big note here. Check a, take a look at the starting color. Okay. We're looking at green. We're looking at black. We're looking at dark colored material. All right. And here's what you're getting on the output. Now for a business, that's huge. That's huge. It's literally turning black or green into gold for most people. So I always like to reinforce that this is why you guys are here to learn how to do this process, how to turn this crude material into a refined cannabis distillate. You can use it in all sorts of products. You can make edibles. You can make uh, uh, vape cartridges. You could do all sorts of crazy infused joints with distillate. Um, you can make all sorts of you know, moon, whatever. The, the, the options are almost limited when it comes to distillate. It is so universal and so neutral that it, it's, it works as a perfect base for product development, whether that's, like I said, vaporizer pens or edibles or topicals or consumables of any sort of type. There's a good question in the chat I want to get to. John was asking me once again, how often should we change the pump oil? This is a fantastic question. And I will just tell you, it's probably in your best interest to change your pump oil every other run. You can get away with using the same pump oil, possibly two distillations in a row. If you want to push it, you could try going for three. But I will tell you more often than not, your distillation problems are going to be because of their pump oil and having uh, impurities in there. You, you guys saw early on, we were, sh we were sending through water content and there was steam and some, you know, that smoke you saw going through the system. Well, all that just went into my pump oil. All that steam and all that moisture and all that impurity, vapor, volatile uh, mixture just went right through into my oil. And that oil probably trapped it. It acts like a condenser and any smoke and stuff going through the oil is just getting condensed into the oil and then stays trapped. Well, that impacts our vacuum level and can really hinder the performance of the distillation process. It could mean that if we didn't have a good enough vacuum, this temperature down here would probably be upwards in 230 Celsius or more. As a rule of thumb, if you are doing distillation and your distillation happens to exceed temperatures of 225 degrees Celsius, if you're finding that you have to increase, keep increasing temperatures, keep increasing temperatures before you see reactions in your distillation head that look like this, you've got a problem, okay? You need to be seeing reactions in, distilla uh, in the distillation process happening around 215 and under. If you are not seeing distillation happen under, uh, well, actually, it should be 225 and under. I'll give you a little bit more of a window. If you see it happening at 225 and over with your temperatures, that you're getting reactions to start like this, it tells you you have a problem. The two problems you can have are one, you didn't filter good enough, so there's a bunch of crap or crud in your oil, so it's elevating the boiling points. That's probably step one I would look at. Step two is look at your vacuum level or your vacuum pump and check it with a gauge. That's why I have this digital gauge here connected off to the side of my vacuum as I test it. Before I even use it for distillation, I rule out the vacuum oil as a problem. So I go through, I heat up the oil, I make sure to run it for a good 20 minutes, the pump, and then I hook it up to my tester. I test its gauge level, and then I will get into distillation. That makes sure to rule out any problem with my pump. Then from there on, it's only possible that I have a leak because I didn't grease my joints well enough, or I didn't, maybe I'm missing a, a gasket inside of my thread on GL connectors. These little red connectors, connectors on the end of the hoses, they unscrew and they have a gasket on the back side of them. Sometimes you drop it and you lose the gasket. So make sure all the gaskets are there, your joints are greased, 
and then the only real concern you could be worried about is impurities. You didn't filter good enough. You didn't get it cold enough during winterization, maybe. A lot of people make the mistake and they'll use not cold enough temperatures for winterization. They'll go about their winterization with just using like a freezer at home in a mason jar. They'll, they'll be like, oh, I used the freezer at home. Wasn't that good enough? Well, it kind of helps. But not everything gets solid at only freezer temperatures. Sometimes it takes even colder temperatures for fats and lipids to coagulate for them to solidify inside of that mixture. So getting it colder is also another thing. And then finally, how good of a filter did you use when you filtered the product? If you're using like a cheesecloth and you're not using a real fine filter, well then it's likely that particulates and impurities make it right past your filter and into your end product, which elevate your boiling point. So those are things to look at when it comes to your distillation and your temperatures. If you see anything over 215, 225, I'm saying 225 really is the cutoff. 225 and over, if you start seeing you're having a problem getting any sort of distillate to pop out, you got to look at your vacuum level and impurities in your product. That's the problem. So you guys can see we're cruising along. Everything's looking really good. Our reaction is consistent. Our output flask is just filling away. She's going, man. She is really going. Really steady, consistent output feed. I'm really enjoying it. Now, did anybody notice that we're starting to maybe change shades a little bit in color? I did. I noticed it a little bit ago. Uh, that we're kind of a little bit more of an amber-ish color now. Not so much the really, really light yellow color that we first started seeing coming off. It's now a little bit more of a amber color. A, maybe a golden color I'm looking at. John's got a good question. He's saying that first fraction, that first head, the output flask, do you toss that or do you save it? What are you going to do with that? Well, John, that's a good question. Um, the, the first fraction that we collected, that really uh, volatile terpene mixture, that's pretty much non-usable at this point. There's nothing you're going to get away using it. There's nothing you could do to save any of the terpenes out of there. The heat and exposure to that has degraded them too much. They stink. In fact, when you smell this process, like right now, I don't smell much. I have everything exhausted, which is good. You will smell it in your lab. But when I open up these flasks and I break them off and I open that first one and I smell it, it's going to smell like straight death. It's not pleasant. Let me put it that way. It smells not very good. Um, it's because of the degradation. It's the decomposition that happens throughout paralysis of the of the uh the the components in there so that fraction that fraction of the head which is maybe i don't know 15 20 30 gram i don't know how much is in there i have to weigh it afterwards and figure out i teared all the flasks so i'll take a look afterwards and figure out how much our head fraction received but that is pretty much unusable some people maybe like to run it again um, just to separate out any maybe because earlier I told you that I put a little bit of the distillate into that first fraction. That made sure to clear out the pathway of the distillation head. It made sure that it, it made a clean transition over to distillate before I swapped the, to the main flask in the middle. So there might be a gram or two in there. And th there's most certainly a little bit of cannabinoids in that terpene content. So depending on what your, what your demand to keep that is, you might want to save those flasks into a very large container over time to the point where you have enough material to do a complete run out of all head fractions. Does that make sense? So 
while it's unusable, you maybe, you maybe want to keep it around, stored in containers as waste, you know, head fraction waste. And over time, you're going to collect enough head fraction waste that you're actually going to have enough THC content to produce, you know, maybe a half ounce of distillate or an ounce of distillate or whatever it is. But when it comes to refinement, I guess really nothing is waste. Because refinement is refinement. There's always going to be a, uh, uh, there's always going to be a process or something to come up with a way to, to handle waste. Um, and in cannabis specifically, there's there's so many processes being created that it's probably wise to just save it for now. You might be able to do some experiments with it in the in the future. So I'm going to take a look in the bottom of the flask here and see what we're looking like. I'll give you guys a shot of that. So we got a good little mixture rolling at the bottom here. It's a puddle. You can see it's just spinning. There's a good, there's a good amount in there, I'm not going to lie. Uh, so this is probably going to go on for anybody who's curious how much more we probably have going into just straight distillation. You're probably looking at at least another hour, hour and a half to finish up this product here. It's just a rough guesstimate. And I'll give you guys another shot on the output. This is just consistent. It is really gold. It's just coiling in there. I can just see a stream just flowing in. Just checking in on the reaction again. The head is staying consistent. I'm, I have no reason to go anywhere for the temperatures. We're at 215, holding steady. Output fraction is collecting at a rate which I'm very happy about. The reflux in the distillation head is not crazy. It's not throwing distillate uh, up over into the condenser. It's doing its job as it should, fluttering along. I put 260 grams in here, and I expect that I'll probably get, this is just an estimate based on my experience, I'll probably, I'll probably receive around a 50% a yield by weight. So if I put 260 in there, I'll probably get around 130 grams of final end distillate. And the potency of that distillate will probably be roughly 85 to 90 percent, maybe a little bit higher, 92, 93 at the high end. This one I suspect is probably just based on temperatures. Um, I could probably back down a couple degrees and hit that 212 sweet spot and probably hit around an 88 percent output potency, just based on rough guesstimates. I've done distillation for the last three years almost. In fact, uh, if you search YouTube, short path distillation, open, sources view, uh, open source steel's video is the number one resource ever produced in history for uh, short path distillation of cannabis. We have the most views of any distillation video surrounding cannabis, over 350,000 views, actually almost 400,000 views at this point. Any of you guys seen that video? That was, a, that was an interesting time period. Let me see. I'll pull it up for you guys. Just so you guys can see it. Who here remembers this video? Anybody see this? This was classic. This was um, 
one of our early distillations, just running a demo for a client, a good friend of ours, not even a client, just a good friend. Eat. See, we're using an old Welch over there, and this is very early on, 2016. In this video, we're doing CBD, and we heat it up, we get everything going, and uh, we actually end up making some CBD crystal, which is funny to look back on now, because look at how goopy this stuff was. It was so dark and goopy. Uh, we melted it into our flask. We didn't even winterize it. This video was us. Yes, this is our video. So you can see early on, this was using a 5 liter distillation head with much more theoretical plating. Can you guys see how many different levels of theoretical plating are in here? And you'll see it when we start really getting into the reaction, those theoretical plates doing their job. You can see we're monitoring the, temp the temperature on this one. How much more green that product is in this video. Amazing. I want to show you guys towards the end. Oh, there's the theoretical plating really doing the work there. But towards the end, we actually get to the point where we start producing an isolate of CBD right here. Look at this. It is crystallizing in the condenser itself. It was making CBD crystals as it was exiting. It was that high potency. Now CBD naturally wants to crystallize, unlike uh, THC. So you can, you can crystallize CBD during distillation and after distillation, but with THC it is not possible. So in that video, it's funny because it's such an early video in 2016, uh, but we actually were isolating and crystallizing CBD during distillation. It was fantastic. It's pretty cool. Checking in on everything going on. The head is performing exceptionally. I'm loving it right now. This is great. This is great. Performing just as I want. Now, for today, I could get picky. And I'll tell you guys, at this point, I probably would be rotating my flask. All right? I've collected a good 100 grams or so easily in this bottom flask, close to about 100 grams here, uh, because I see that this flask is almost getting towards half full. The clarity is exceptional, looking really good. Gonna let this run, do its thing. Um, but like I said, I could rotate the flask at this point. The color of the distillate has really started to get a little bit more of a even more amber color, orange just amber color. Um, and to save and preserve all that color in the middle main body, I might want to rotate the flask, just collect it as a separate shade or a separate uh, output fraction. But for all intents and purposes of today's video. I think I'm going to stick to collecting most everything in one flask. The reason I say that is because I do plan on running this material once again. So I'll, I've done one single pass on it today. Today is going to be the first pass of distillation. That really cleans things up. That really gets things refined, gets you towards that higher potency of almost nearly 90%. Sometimes it can hit 90 and above. Once you reach that point, you're also going to want to pass it a second time uh, because there is going to be a small trace impurities in the product still. You're never going to get 99.9% .9 purity right off a single pass. So it's always a good uh, suggestion to do another pass. It'll just refine it even further. It will remove any of the 
It'll get rid of any, not all of it, but it, it can help get rid of any of the main, remaining stink or stench that might be left behind. Um, from the uh, terpenes. And it overall will just give you a better product. If you smell a distillate, now you're not going to know this until you actually get your hands on this process and, and smell it for yourself, but if you get some distillate and it smells like lobster butter, you guys ever remember that term? They used to call it lobster butter, the distillate. They used to say, oh, I'm smoking that lobster butter. It used to be a signature flavor that people expected out of distillate. Well, that's degradation. That's what you don't want to be tasting. So if, you're, if your distillate tastes like, quote unquote, lobster butter, you're probably going to want to run that distillate more than one time for sure. All right, so as things keep going here, I noticed that my temperature has dropped a degree. I also notice, if anybody else noticed, while my output is still flowing consistently for my distillate, I do notice the reaction in the vigro indentation has slowed a little, not by much, but it is kind of now just consistent and not really reactive. It seems like it's kind of settling down a little bit. And that also is an indicator because the, t the temperature at 215 is kind of back down a little bit to 214. So I am going to kick it up just a couple of degrees to 218. It's just going to help to keep things active again, pick the temperature up, and help push out this last little bit. Having to increase my temperature towards the end is, is, is not kind of expected. It is expected because, as we talked about, the ratio mixture in this bottom boiling flask is always going to be increasing over time and impurities because we are distilling out what we want to capture and collect and we're only leaving behind the crude material we don't want in that flask. So that is why the color is slowly changing. That is also why things are slowing slightly, not much, just slightly, and why I'm going to slowly increase the temperature a few degrees to compensate. We're back to 215. The reaction is starting to sputter again out the top. You can see the rate of flow here from this angle, which is pretty good actually, this, both these angles together. You can see the distillation head. Oh, you're not seeing it. From this angle, you can see both the head and the receiving flask collecting. Look at the output there, that is amazing. I'm just going to leave it here because that's, that's a pretty killer view. So we're seeing consistently about one drop every half second, maybe one drop every second. So if you try to equate this to what exactly the output over time would be. When we started this distillation right around 130 or so, uh, we got hung up with the internet, so maybe about 145. We're going about an hour and a half or so. And I'd say we've produced around 120 grams. 125 grams. We're at the halfway point for sure, this 250 flask. So you're looking at a couple grams a minute.
I'd say the good estimate around three grams, two and a half, three grams a minute. That's at a good, good pace here. Now, does anybody have any questions up until this point? I know we've been going through the lab demonstration. Is there any questions about the process around temperatures or anything of that nature? This should be a pretty straightforward process. And to be honest, as long as you get your filtration correct and you don't mess up the setup, this should be a fairly straightforward process for you. In fact, it'd be, it would be pretty difficult to mess it up just due to the, to the nature of evaporative theory. Once things just start to evaporate, uh, the temperatures start cooling down. So you can't exceed boiling points. You can't skip over the terpene fraction. You can't really mess it up. The only thing is, is you got to be careful about your switching of your fraction. When are you going to go from your terpene head fraction? to your main body cannabinoids. When are you going to make that decision to change over? For me, I like to wait when a couple of grams exit the system, then we rotate the flasks, and then we co uh, collect our distillate. So look at our temperatures. Uh, we're at 218 now. So we've exceeded the 215 mark. We're hitting our set point. Look at my reaction going on in the column. She's boogieing along, I'll tell you. She's boogieing along. I'm not going to change this flask again. I don't think it's necessary for today's class. I'm doing a first pass distillate on this. I'm not, I'm not worried about capturing the tails too much right now in a different flask. Again, towards the bottom of the run, towards the end of the run, you might want to switch to the final and third fl flask just to save yourself because the ratio is going to be higher impurities towards the end. And that impurity is are, are going to cause a change in color and overall uh, purity in your product. So sometimes you catch your main, main body and you catch your tails separately, um, you'll test them and then make a decision whether or not you want to reintroduce them together, keep them separate as batches. John's got a good question. He's asking me, is there any recommendation on cannabis-derived terpenes? Um, you know, for cannabis-derived terpenes, I don't have any suggestions for you. Uh, the only thing is, I'm seeing is people taking sauce terpenes or uh, poured off terpenes from an extract and mixing them with distillate. I'm not sure I'm the biggest fan of that. Um, I haven't really tried a lot of them. I do know there are people that have SOPs or standard operating procedures for terpene extraction using CO2. Now I know that that is a very experimental but uh, a very, um, what is the word I'm looking for? You can definitely get cannabis-derived terpenes out of a CO2 extractor. I have tried some personally that were very good. They tasted like cannabis-derived product, and I really enjoyed them. However, uh, I'm not sure that there's a lot of people with CO2 extractors who quite understand that process enough to get a reproducible terpene extract every time. Christina is asking me, will you be introducing the terpene back into the distillate? Uh, now that's going to be a business decision that you'd need to make on your own. However, I will let you know that you do have some options regarding terpene reintroduction. So once we finish this process, obviously we have a neutral base to work with. Our product does not have any terpenes or flavor in them. <coughs> So in order to make a consumable product, we need to reintroduce some form of terpenes. Now, there's, you know, questions on what, what is the best method or what should be allowed and not allowed in the industry. But as of currently, there are a few methods of reintroduction that you have. 
One, uh, you can use organically derived terpene sources. Organic meaning actual plants like oranges or lemons or pine trees or other forms of essential oil terpenes that can be captured through other botanical sources. Those can be collected and sold to consumers. Um, and more often than not, the results that you get are kind of fake tasting. They don't taste like you would expect a cannabis plant to taste. So mixing uh, a terpene together is common. So one thing people like to do is, is try to reproduce a strain like OG Kush or Dutch Treat or you name it. They will, they will take test results of terpene spectrum analysis and they will try to buy over the counter organic sources of terpenes. For example, beta pinene or alpha pinene, mycerine, humulene, uh, terpenoline. There's so many different terpenes that you can purchase over the counter that are also in cannabis. And essentially, you have people trying to recreate recipes from terpene tests using organic derived terpene sources and recreating the palate or uh, the flavor that you're trying to get. Now, in my experience, it hasn't been, there hasn't been that many reproducible results that I would you know, like to smoke over and over again. Uh, it never ever, in my opinion, reaches the essence of the plant in its original state. It's always about trying to create something that maybe could, shoulda, woulda taste like it. Um, it does have flavor. In some cases, they taste like floor cleaners. In some cases, they taste like bubble gum. In some cases, they taste like a really pleasant candy. Um, it just depends on what terpenes you mix together and your source of terpenes. As long as they're organically derived, uh, uh, FDA approved, you know, safe for consumption in small quantities, then I see people experimenting a lot with organically derived terpenes. Your next option is, uh, I know that there's people out there that are using flavorings of some sorts. I'm not sure what they are. Um, I know that people use uh, a few terpene companies out, out there that, that can produce, you know, these kind of flavor, strawberry or blueberry, that are not necessarily cannabis-derived flavors or cannabis-inspired uh, flavors, but more so consumable products that people would enjoy, like berries or fruit. Um, there, is, there is products on the market. I'm not sure exactly what's in them. Some of them are proprietary. They don't like to give it away. They just say, hey, it's a consumable e-juice for, you know, uh, strawberry. Okay, guys, I want to know, look behind me. I want to point out, look at the color. Look at that color. All right. And I can see my flask is starting to change color over here too. So I'm actually going to rotate this. I didn't think I was going to, but I am. So I'm final rotation here. Just because I can and I will. Make sure to keep this rotated up and I can start to smell degradation you guys. So in this room it hasn't been until this point that I really smelt a lot of degradation. But at this point I definitely am starting to smell I don't know what to call it but it's smelling a little bit not burnt but is getting in that territory of starting to smell a little bit more unpleasant for sure. Look at that color. It is a red, a deep red color. This is due to the residence time. This is because of impurities, the extended residence time in the flask. Also, it has to do with heat and oxidation. So as this product is heated, as this product experiences UV, as this product, if it were to experience oxygen, it will begin to turn, turn a different shade of color. 
As the pH is adjusted, it will also change color. So here we're on the tail fraction for sure. If I look in my flask, it is very thin. You can see the stir bar now at the bottom. And it is spinning a very thin, very thin, but extremely dark green film of liquid on the outside walls now. It's not black, it's not, I mean, it's not brown. It is very dark green in color. And I'm towards the bottom because it's just, let me slow this down a little bit. Look how small my puddle is in there. Can you see that? I'll take off this, I'll take off some of this rope so you guys can see also. I don't really need it all. Ooh, it's warm. Holy cow. Careful, this rope is going to be hot. It's been sitting on a flask this whole time. Okay, I'm going to open this up so you guys can see the end of the distillation process. You can get an idea of where we're going to finalize things here shortly. Now, I could keep running this and actually turn the stir bar on. Look at how nasty and green that is. We're left with pretty much, we're getting towards chlorophylls and just ugly impurities. You can see I really want to spin this against the walls of the surface area to make sure I get it nice and coated. So I can keep pushing this here. Ew, look at the color of this distillate coming out. Look at our flasks on the end. Red color. Now, looks a little bit like that picture, huh? Kind of at the same point now with this. Here. So, as a business owner or somebody working in an apartment and trying to be as efficient as possible, right? You kind of get to this point in the process where you're starting to make a decision. How much more do I want to squeeze? How much more am I going to try to juice out of this puddle here? And that question should be something you're conscious of because the longer and the more you distill out of this end bottoms, obviously the more impurity it's going to be coming across, it's going to be higher in impurities, it's going to get darker in color towards the end. So you got to ask yourself, do I want to keep adding all this dark material? And B, when I'm finished here, I need to have, I want to be able to clean out this flask. I don't want to run this thing dry. My goal is not to get every last drop out of the flask from the end. If I do that, I'll start to begin to cake up on the outside of the wall of my, my glassware. It'll make it a nightmare to get out and clean. It's overall just going to be a bad time. So. What I tend to do is I'll stop the stir bar real quick, see where we're at. We got a little bit of ways to go here. I'll keep pushing for maybe about 20 minutes at the most, okay? I don't want maybe 15. I'm going to give it 15 minutes here. Uh, what time is it? It's 3.38. So we'll go just before 4 o'clock, which we'll try to wrap things up here at 4. Uh, we'll kind of talk about the final discussion. We'll have a wrap-up discussion here. Um, we'll talk quickly about cleanup. What's the easiest, safest way to clean up your glassware? When should you do it? But we'll let this run for another 15 minutes or so here, and then we'll cover all those, those topics. Is there anybody who has questions up until this point? Any questions I can help answer for you? Are you confused about anything? Um, also, I'm looking at my vacuum pump at the end here. 
Uh, let me give you guys a wide shot. I'm looking at this vacuum pump here, and on the front side of it, right here is a circle. It's got a window in it, a glass window, and I can see my oil level there. When I'm looking at it right now, I can see that that oil is extremely clear. There's no bubbles in it. It's not frothy. It's not cloudy in any way, shape, or form. I don't see things floating in it. Actually, for oil on a pump, this is really, really clean after a run like today. I'm going to say that this, this oil is very, it's more than likely going to have no problem running again. This oil is clean. I'll do a test afterwards just to make sure. Uh, my oil level is right on the line. It hasn't exceeded the line, it hasn't dropped at all. Again, it doesn't look frothy. If you get impurities in it, you'll see the oil level start to raise a little bit above the line. So just pay attention to that. Just gonna let this run again. Keep going. Now, now distillate in, I don't know what market you guys are all coming from. I know there's a couple guys on the East Coast and then some California guys in the class today. But where we're from, distillate and cartridges are making up a majority of the concentrate market. So this process is absolutely essential to most businesses coming into the industry. Um, and you're going to notice that after this class, obviously this is an introductory class to get you up to speed, to teach you the basics. Um, so you understand and are able to execute on yourself. However, there is a lot of changes always being made to distillation every day. Every year, there's always new evolving things entering the market. So you can expect to learn a bunch after this class. This isn't going to be the end of your distillation uh, life. You're gonna, I'm sure you're going to be running into other subjects like filtration will become another uh, another key area where you're going to want to do some research or you're also going to want to just pay attention to and try to make efficient as possible. Filtration is a big bottleneck for a lot of people because A, you got to take the time to make the liquid cold and wait 12 to 24 hours and then filter it's really slow. So filtration and media will be uh, a concept that you'll definitely want to look into. All right, you guys, I'm going to end things here. I'm going to call it quits. I am no longer uh, going to let this go through. Look at this distillation head. Look at the color. It's almost red tinge all the way into the glass. Look at my head condenser head. Look at that ugly color. OK. Flask is really not reacting a whole lot. In fact, it's just spitting the darkest green nasty goop all over this flask right now. And I want to save my life from having to clean a mess when I'm done here. So I'm going to leave the product as it is. We're going to end here for the distillation process. So what I'm going to do to, to stop or to complete my process is one of two things. First, uh, I want to go ahead and turn off my vacuum pump. All right. And at the same time of doing that, I'm going to turn down my temperatures. To zero, and I'm going to hit set. I'm going to turn off my heater. This is no longer required. And I'm going to let things kind of settle down. Now that I've done that, you can see that the reaction of my uh, distillation is completely pretty much stopped in the distillation head. The reason that stopped is because we've increased pressure. It's like we added a bunch of weight. And uh, let me kick this on real quick, actually. We've added a bunch of weight into the environment, so things are now more difficult to evaporate. You got to be careful turning it off too hot too and opening up the system. Um, 
uh, because as you open up one of the hose lines, you're obviously going to rush in a bunch of oxygen. Oxygen is going to condense into water vapor into the flask, and it can cause you know smoke to start forming in there, or you know what you would think to be smoke. But I like to let things. I turn things off. I leave the stir feature running. You want to make sure that your stir bar is running while things are cooling down a little bit. Okay, I'm just going to close this off now because now I'm starting to boil over there. Also, you notice the temperature increased a little bit because I increased the pressure. So the temperature increased a little bit because of increase in pressure. Boiling point did at least. And there we go. Um, I'm going to let this just kind of settle for a second. I will pull off one of these flasks or two of these flasks and I'll give you guys a close up of what the product looks like here now that we finished. So I'm going to break open my vacuum one last time. At least give it some pressure here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to detach this flask back here so you guys can take a look at what we're seeing on our end. Now, actually, I don't have a scale with me. But if I open this up and I smell it, I definitely can smell a little bit of something in here, okay? It's not going to smell 100% pleasant. This isn't going to be um, the most appealing thing to just sniff. <coughs> but um, if I look at the overall volume, I filled about half this flask, which is what I expected. Um, in fact, I do have another scale in the other room, and I'll go grab it just a second. Okay, so I'm going to tear this out real quick. I need another. Do I have another? I don't. I'll just use this one real quick. Set this on here. I'm going to tear this out. There we go. And I'll set my flask in. Oh, it says we're overloaded. Let's see, I have another scale. Try this one. This one holds 500, or actually 5,000 grams. It's not quite as accurate, but this one here, we'll put this on and we'll tear out our cork. And we're looking at 269 grams, is what it says. And let's see, 269. And if I take away our tear weight, which was 144. Point four, we're looking at 125 grams as our end yield for today's demonstration. So uh, my total was about 260, give or take a couple grams. It was rough, 250, 260. I lost a little bit in the stickiness of the process trying to put it all together. I still have it somewhere. But out of 260 grams, we got 125 grams. So we're just around 50% yield, which I expected from today's get-go. So you can really, I mean, if I can do this, right, if I can be here and I can, I can judge based on the crude starting material, I never have worked with this material before. It's from a random source. So it's the first time I've gotten my hands on this product. And so just based on my experience in distillation in the past, I have a good understanding of what I can expect when it comes to this process. Just take a little bit here. I want to make sure that this oil doesn't drip on the table. So, like I said, just based on my understanding experience in the past of doing distillation, I know that I'm going to get a roughly 
even just by starting weight, about 50% yield, maybe a little less, which is to be expected. You could get anywhere from, I'd say, 40 to 60% yield. Um, rare cases, sometimes higher, but I haven't really seen that much. But, you know, on average, you can, yes, 40 to 60% yield and be confident. Um, with 125 grams output, I, I know that that's uh, expected. I feel really happy about it. The color is, uh, is good. I think I could have rotated sooner so you guys can see. Actually, let me, let me do this. Show you this here. So the color, I think it could have been a little bit better. The clarity, though, you guys, is very clear. Uh, if you're looking through the bottom of the flask, you don't want to see any sort of swirls, okay? So in this flask, I don't see any swirling. It looks very see-through, very clear. I could read through the other side of it. If I start to see hazy streaks inside of my oil, that's going to tell me I likely have impurities or fats still in the product. So you guys can see right there how clear the other side is. Now it's at this point where I could take this product and distill it another time. And I'm most likely going to see the next time I distill it, I will probably see around an 85 percent yield, maybe 90 percent or even more higher yield. So I should be able to distill most everything over except for a small little pile of orange, which would be left behind of impurities. Um, and it would lighten the color of this product up even another shade. This is more of like an amber golden color, but if I wanted to make this even a lighter, lighter yellow color, I could do that by doing another pass, which would work. So there we have it. Is there any questions? Does anybody have any questions? It's at this point in time where we can start to think about breaking down our distillation kit, start to disassemble everything we have to, to go in the kit. And I want to talk about um, how to safely clean this glassware and make it as easy as possible on your life because I've been doing this for three years and teaching classes and I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody come up to me and tell me, hey man, I don't know what the heck to do with this flask, but I can't get the crap out of this flask or uh, my flask is so ground up, I don't know how to get rid of it all. Well, you're going to have some marking. You're going to have, you know, you can't keep things perfect forever. However, nine times out of ten when people tell me they're having a hard time cleaning their flask or they got stuff all sorts of gummed up in it, it's because they haven't cleaned it properly. They didn't do it during the proper time frame. You need to make sure that if you have glassware that needs to be cleaned, you do it shortly after it's done running. All those people that have issues with their glassware saying that they can't clean it or yada, 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 usually call me a, you know, a, after they left it sitting for a day or two and it's cooled down. That's a no-no. That's where you're going to have a problem. The second you let this bottom material in here cool down at room temperature, it will turn into a stone practically. It's going to turn into a tar, a rock-solid, black, goopy tar. It will not, you, you'll be able to touch it with your hands and fingers and it won't even be sticky. It'll be solid like stone. So uh, you need to make sure that you're doing that. Just a second here. Sorry about that, I had a message coming in, I had to answer. Uh, but what I was saying is that you don't wanna let this thing cool down overnight and then try to, f try to clean it out the day after. That's when you're gonna run into issues. It's gonna solidify in the flask and then you're never going to be able to get it out of there essentially. Even no matter what you do, if you put hot you know, alcohol in there, put it back on the mantle and try and heat it up, that stuff really gets solid and then it almost makes it impossible to clean out. So what I like to do is turn off the unit. I let it cool down by letting the stir bar just spin inside. While the stir bar is you know, doing its job, 
Um, I move everything out of the way. I start disconnecting my coal trap is one of the first things. My vacuum pump. And you'll notice, I'm going to show you guys a close up of this hose. This was the hose used in between the vacuum pump and our cow. You'll notice that it did get a little bit of distillate into the end. You want to try to keep these hoses as short as possible and re throw them out after a while. After one or two runs, you're going to want to throw away your hoses. They stink, they get distillate in them, and they start making your other batches stink. So cleaning the hoses or taking the hoses and tossing them, uh, cutting short lengths and, and swapping them out every run or every other run or couple runs is probably good. It'll save you from dealing with that stench. It smells like death, I promise. You don't want to have to deal with it. All right, so I'm taking all my pieces and putting them in a bag here for next time in case I need them. So all my GL joints and everything like that. But the idea is when this flask cools down to under about 100 degrees Celsius, you know, once it gets to around, you know, 75 degrees Celsius or so, 80 degrees Celsius, then it's good to take it out or even before then and try to pour this material while it's hot, while it's still viscous, pour it into a mason jar, pour it into some container where you can try to save those bottoms and collect them. But don't save it in that flask. I'll tell you what, you'll have a bad time. So, I'm going to take this coal trap and move this off to the side here because we don't need the coal trap anymore. In fact, that's a cold coal trap. I'm going to take this over here. We'll empty and save this alcohol for next time. Okay. Okay, next thing's going to come off. We can take all of our cow or our pig receiver out. I'll step on the back side here and do that. Before I do, I'm going to grab some non-stick surface to set this on. I know better. Some parchment paper here. Non-stick parchment. Just to set this on. So I've got my cat clip disconnected. Rotate the head and pull it off. Set this aside. Now this is where you're really gonna start smelling the stench. Ugh. It's very unpleasant. You don't wanna have to deal with it, but hey, that's part of the process. Ugh, 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 ugh. So here's your terpene fraction. Here's your first fraction. Notice how it is very viscous, but also notice it's, it's quite oily. So there's definitely terpenes in here, but there's also maybe a, sl you know, maybe a gram or two of cannabinoids dissolved in those terpenes. But this, uh, I will tell you, there's not really much you can do with this. I would just either save it and collect it until maybe you have a batch big enough you can redistill and maybe collect something out of it, or just toss it. Not really going to do you a whole lot. So, just connect this one over here. So we have two, two flasks here. Set these in the cat clips as my little flask holders, I guess. Now, um, I can go ahead and take out my distillation head and be very careful because things are still warm. Right? They're still over 100 degrees Celsius, which could burn you. So if you need to, use some gloves, but it'll be all right. Rotate our head. We're going to take our distillation head out. And I'm going to set this over here onto the side because it still has connected hoses. And actually, I'm going to go set these over here because I have a place to set these. Okay, two of those. All right, now we're pretty much all disconnected. Um, I do want to make sure that I can take this head off, so I will open one of the ports here. That's going to cause it to drain back into the chiller. Now I can take my distillation head and the threads off there. There's no more water in the distillation head. 
I could take that off and set these over here on the side. All right. Last thing is I need to take out the thermometer joint. Done that. I'll set this on my nonstick surface over here. And you're pretty much disassembled with your set. It's at this point you could take a hot glove, grab it, take it out. I would grab uh, and uh, put your distillate or your remaining bottoms in a flask, contain it. I'll see if I have a jar I can do that. I actually can, I collect them. I only have cold jars in here. All right, we'll do this. I'm going to take my flask and I need my stir bar retriever. This is where this comes in handy. I'm going to stick my stir bar retriever in here and I'm going to grab that bad boy. Yum. All right, set my stir bar over here. It is, look at how black that is. That is nasty. So that's what's in the bottom of your flask right now. You do not want to get stuck in there. And I will take this flask. Now you can see the small amount that's left in it. And I will pour it here. It is so black, you guys. Okay. This is just dripping. And essentially what you have here is black. It is black. And the reason that is, is it's what you have is essentially carbon. You have, we're using organic chemistry, which is based on carbon. And uh, we're, we've essentially heated up all that product and reduced a lot of that product down. Anything in here is essentially just carbon decomposed material broken down into just pure carbon. Okay, next, I'm going to take my funnel, which I don't have with me, but I do have Pyrex. And I'll put a little alcohol in here and be careful. If you're messing with alcohol. I'll pour a little bit into this. And I'm going to slowly pour some into this flask. Okay, now I'll take this flask and I'm going to stir it around and look immediately what's happening. Look how clean I'm able to get this flask if I just clean it pretty much right away. It's coming all off the walls. I have a cover here. Most people might want to take a little stopper. They have uh, tools for this. I'm actually going to step out here and grab a rag and try and get this done. Okay. Actually, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to show you one more trick. So now that I have my alcohol in here, if for whatever reason you still have a little sludge on the sides like I do, okay, what I'm going to do is my flask is relatively clean after stirring all this bottom in here is I'm going to just heat up this alcohol a little bit and it's going to help pull this all down. So let me just do that. Stick it in here. I'm going to grab my thermometer probe and I'm going to stick it back in one of the joints. I'm going to set the temperature up again around 80 degrees Celsius just to Try and get the alcohol to heat up. And what that's going to do is the vapors are going to try and travel up the outside of the flask and it's just going to kind of melt the oil down into the flask. And once it does that, I'll just pick it up and pour it all out. So there we go. There's our bottoms for today. And I'll coat the jar with it. And you guys can't even see through the jar. It is so black. So this is the crud and the crap you do not want in your product. 
collect all my Keck clips in one bag so I have them for next round. Everything in one simple spot here. Make it easy. Holy cow, that stuff stinks. Smells like garbage, smells like trash. Okay, so while that's going and while that's slowly heating up, I'm just coming over here to kind of pick up a little bit, grab some stuff. Also, another cool trick, once we get that alcohol to kind of melt this stuff back down, to clean your distillation head, you can do the same thing. You put this distillation head on top of a, uh, on top of a flask with some alcohol. You just put a cup underneath here and hot alcohol will run through this inside and it will just wipe out and clear out this whole entire distillation head so use it like it's supposed to be used just distill some alcohol through it real quick or if you have an ultrasonic cleaner you're always welcome to use an ultrasonic or uh, an autoclave if you're fancy enough to have an autoclave in your laboratory an autoclave with some solvents would be ideal fortunately we don't have an autoclave so we're just going to use a little bit of alcohol. I'm just using isopropyl. I'm not even using ethanol. That would be too expensive for this. Just using some iso. Put a little bit in there while it's warm. Shake it around. Heat it up. Distill it through the head. And I'll even use this jar to collect some of that alcohol when I distill it through the head. So look. Look at the alcohol. Look what's already doing. It's pulling down this gunk and sludge already out of the joint, and it's already falling down in the bottom of the flask because the vapors are kind of... You can see it, actually. You can see the alcohol vapors right here. On the inside of the flask, just kind of heating up. And as they do that, it's just going to melt right back down into it. So I'll leave this here and we'll just let this go. I'll encourage some movement here by taking this stick and just kind of Get a rag and come up here and wipe that out, but you guys get the idea. It's pretty simple. Just use the use the solvents and the tools you have at your disposal. It'll make your life easy. I can't tell you how many people told me this is a nightmare. They're like, oh, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how you keep your your flask clean. I don't know how you could get all that oil out of there. Or, you know, it's just about doing it in a timely fashion so that you don't get stuck with sludge behind. And then B. Use your solvents. Use some alcohol. You know, alcohol is alongside water. It's the number one solvent. So I'm gonna wipe this joint out a little bit just to help speed this up. Because I want to stick that distillation head back in here. Okay. So I cleaned out that joint. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stick a distillation head on the side port. It's the wrong one, but it'll work. Then I'll stick my jar right here. Put my tip over the end. Let it do its thing. So I'm going to move these off to the side because you guys don't really need these views anymore. This is just kind of in the way. I'll just give you guys main view. Let's see.
Let's see, I'll do this. All right. So I'm going to let this kind of distill. I can already start to see it kind of falling through the head already. Let me heat it up just a little bit more. Make sure that it boils over. But essentially we're done with the entire process. Now it's just about wiping your counter surfaces up and making sure to clean up and prep for next round. Is there any final questions before we wrap up today? From any of the students? Let's see. I, John is saying, he said, uh, I have a 10 liter system from Across. It has a double head with a 1,000 milliliter collection vessel on either side of the boiling flask. It doesn't have a triple cow, so how would I separate the head from the body of the collected distillate? Uh, that's a good question, John. Uh, the answer is those systems made by Cross International are made to do main body fractions. So in, you'd, you'd have to do a separate run of your heads. Um, or you can get some sort of vacuum takeoff adapters, which are essentially a, uh, a valve that allows you to swap out the flask or during the run. So there is some options for you. Uh, however, you are correct that there's not really a way to swap the head fractions. If you wanted to, you maybe could get away with running you know, the heads on one side of the distillation and then switching over to the second head on the other side for your main body fraction, but that's not ideally how you would want to run that kind of system. You'd want to run them both together, doing one main fraction at the same time. All right, so with that, we're going to wrap up today. I want to say thank you guys all. Oh, okay, Christina's got a question, excuse me. She says, can we do a follow-up on introducing the terpenes back into our distillate and so that it is evenly dispersed throughout the distillate? That's a great question, Christina. So um, reintroducing terpenes, we kind of briefly talked on it. Uh, we mentioned that you have organic derived sources of terpenes, say, you know, pine trees and lemons and all sorts of different uh, medicinal or herbal products out there. Or I should say botanical, excuse me. Um, and then you obviously have some of the synthetic non-cannabis, non-organic derived terpenes, some of the synthetic formulations that have flavors like strawberries that are not really derived from organic solutions or maybe organic derived solutions but are mixed together in a way that have like a, a non-natural tasting flavor, like a sour watermelon or something like that. And then you have cannabis derived terpenes, which are going to be the most difficult to come across in our industry, uh, strictly because there's not a large amount of producers being able to produce quality terpenes uh, out of an extraction. Um, some of them are doing uh, some experimentation with what they call sauce or the terpenes poured off of a crystallized cannabinoid. Um, and there, there are some people playing with experimenting on mixing distillates and that terpene content. Um, I'm not sure that there's really a, a, a consensus or a majority of the people that's, that agree on that kind of technology or that kind of uh, approach. More so often than not, you're going to find people mixing non-cannabis organic derived terpenes in order to create something proprietary for them. So you'll go online on sources, finding non-cannabis derived terpenes, mixing together all sorts of ones that maybe you like the smell of, or finding a recipe based on test results of another uh, strain in the market. So say you found uh, some Girl Scout cookies and you really wanted to recreate it. Well, you could go find test results for terpenes at a laboratory and purchase those individual terpene profiles in, in bottles and you could create your own, um, own mixture of terpenes 
based on the ratios in those tests. So if there's 2% mycerin, we'll add 2% by volume of mycerin to whatever mixture you're creating. Um, obviously, the larger the batch, the easier it is to kind of mix. Um, the smaller batches are going to take a very fine drop. You know, you're going to take a dropper and try and mix one drop of this and one drop of that and mix it with maybe a couple grams to try test batches. The question, going back to a little bit more about your, your question about um, how to get it evenly dispersed throughout the product, uh, that process is called homogenization. And it's important that you homogenize the terpenes and the cannabinoids in order to get even distribution throughout so that you don't get a batch or a small segment of the batch that tastes stronger than the other. You can buy homogenizers online. Um, there's lots of suppliers for them. They're used in the kitchen industry and the medicinal industry uh, all over the world. Basically to shake up and mix the product extremely fine. Um, to get it to, to, to blend together uh, homogeneously. Um, the next thing is if you really want, I see a lot of people just using magnetic stirs, so a hot plate, a simple scientific hot plate, putting a beaker on top of there and mixing it with a magnet, a stir bar, just like we did inside of our, our heating mantle, just using a hot plate instead. I see people do that uh, for mixing it. I'm not sure if a homogenizer works any better, I'd say that um, I see both used throughout the industry. I think it's just what your access is to those devices. I think you can plenty fine get away with just doing a terpene mixture under a hot plate. Um, that's where a lot of brands right now are coming up with their own proprietary flavors, their own proprietary branding and marketing is they're finding through experimentation in the lab, they're testing with lab uh, with um, organic grade terpenes or cannabis derived terpenes, and they are mixing together their own profiles and coming up with something that they can call their own. You know, banana banana lime blueberry, or you know, just as an example of something, putting their own brand on it, creating a banana lime blueberry character, and now it's very difficult uh, for people to recreate that product in the market because they don't know what exactly goes into making it, uh, whether that's the, the terpene types or the amount of terpenes. Um, so people may, they're always trying to reverse engineer recipes from terpene profiles or other, other profiles on the, on the internet, uh, but you're gonna have to just experiment on your own. That's where a lot of people are playing the field right now. Uh, they're trying to create their own proprietary blends. Christina is saying, I already use a stir bar, but does not suffice. Uh, I would definitely look into homogenizer at that point. Homogenizers are uh, industry standard for creating a homogeneous mixture of, uh, of more than one thing. Uh, try that out and see if that works for you. They also have um, machines that do vibration. I know, like they, they, they're, they're kind of like a centrifuge but they're a vibrating, rotating centrifuge mixer. Those work better for uh, topicals and work better for powders and drinks. I don't know if they necessarily work for distillate and terpenes. I think your best bet might be a homogenizer for that. Uh, now, Christina, when you mentioned that you were using a stir bar and adding terpenes together and saying that that doesn't suffice, in what way do you think that it doesn't suffice? Are you finding that your terpenes and your cannabinoids are separating within your cartridges or in your packaging? And is that why you're thinking it doesn't work? Or is it that you're not getting a consistent flavor amongst your batch? Or what is it that you think is not working? Um, the reason I ask that is because terpenes and cannabis oil have different molecular weights. Are you there? You're okay. So basically the issue is there's minor separation um, and so we ended up using kind of like a blender apparatus to homogenize it better, but it's still kind of like...
Yeah, looks like your feedback. So, so I, I got you there. You're okay. All right, when you get uh, headphones, feel free to chime back in, but I, I'm pretty sure I grasp the concept of your question and some of the struggles you're having. You're saying that even after mixing, you're finding slight separation happening, and then you're saying that overall you're, you're not able to get like the flavor consistently mixed into your product. Um, I'd question a couple of things uh, about that is, A, obviously terpenes and cannabis oil, uh, they tend to not, when you when you extract or separate them and then try to reintroduce them together uh, it's very common that you're going to see a separation in terpenes it's just strictly because of the molecular weight um, terpenes are more volatile they're a lighter uh, a compound than cannabis oil so what ends up happening is you'll start to see terpenes separate towards the top and the heavier cannabis oil separate towards the bottom uh, there's not a whole lot that you can do through that process, it's because they're, you're exactly right, they evaporate, they're a lighter compound, so it naturally wants to evaporate from within the oil. They naturally want to evaporate at room temperatures, terpenes are even volatile. So they begin to evaporate at room temperatures, that's why you have to be careful about um, storage of terpenes, uh, oxygen, uh, light, a lot of these things. Now. Also, uh, the next thing was you were saying that you couldn't quite get uh, the mixture of it to mix well in order for flavor. Uh, I would ask what kind of terpenes or where you sourced your terpenes from. Um, it, that could be also dependent on whether or not they're mixed with some terpene companies cut the terpenes down with alcohols or other, you know, unknown um, thinning agents or uh, diluting agents in there. So you do have to be wary of where you're sourcing your terpenes from as well too. Hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. I'll say that um, as far as what I hear on the market, I know that True Terpenes is a company that a lot of people work with. Uh, I personally don't have any experience with them, <clears throat> but I do know that a lot of extractors, a lot of vaporized cartridge makers, uh, Black market, gray market, and in the recreational market, all use true terpenes. Um, it's just a matter of you know what kind of profiles you want to pick. Hopefully that that answers the question. Terpene reintroduction is, I think that, I mean, distillation for a long period of time, maybe two years or so, was a process that was a little unknown. It was kind of like you didn't speak about it, you didn't tell people about it, it was a trade secret that people were trying to keep close. Um, and now, a couple of years later, it's a little bit more accepted in the public, a lot of people know about the process, and now we're really looking into other areas where, again, we have this trade secret, this tribal knowledge that people don't want to share with uh, one another because it is the proprietariness of their business or of their product line. So. I think in the next few years, you're definitely going to see a surge in terpene reintroduction. I mean, it has been for a long time. You're seeing the evolution, the evolution of the vaporizer is huge. I mean, nowadays you're seeing people blowing fat clouds with shatters and waxes out of vaporizers and distillates with the C-cell cartridges and some of the other um, tank or terpenes. So it's, it's one area of the industry where I think is still growing. People are still learning to, what's the best cartridges to use, what's the best style of you know battery and cartridge combo, um, and then we're still kind of trying to get into once we have batteries and combos, how are you getting it consistent enough to draw into the wicking system? Are you adding a certain ratio of terpenes or not? So there's a lot of experimental uh, stuff going on in that area. I would just say that your best bet, like I said, is is to try to create a proprietary um, blend of organic drive terpenes 
Um, next, uh, you're seeing more and more CO2 extractors and more people that are understanding terpene extraction um, that are starting to reintroduce cannabis-derived terpenes. But those are going to be more limited on the market due to the fact that it is such a high, um, it needs such a, a large amount of product or material and good quality material in order to produce a good quality terpene. So the concentration of terpenes is even smaller than even cannabis. So uh, it's going to take time for things to scale up in the industry before we see cannabis derived terpenes for sure. Uh, let's see, Christina was asking, is there any way to do it maybe through some type of evaporation? I'm not sure what you're referring to. I think that was to the earlier point we were talking about. <clears throat> but yeah, I hope, I hope that answers the question regarding terpenes. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a race to the top right now to try and figure that out for a lot of companies. Uh, the majority of the market is now vape pens, so you're going, you're going to see answers to that uh, coming over the next year for sure. Okay, well if we don't have any more questions, we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, again, I want to say thank you to everybody for joining today's live feed. I hope you guys learned a couple of things throughout the process today. Um, as a reminder, I want to let you guys know that all of the content that was presented in the uh, slides in the lecture is available in your email uh, immediately. The link is going to stay active. Uh, you just need to click it in order to view it. It'll be open to you guys at any time to go back and review. If you have questions following up from this class and want to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion, maybe over the phone or Skype conversation, however you prefer. Um, you have my contact information. I'm available for you guys Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So feel free to reach out to me directly. I will be offering around two hours uh, per student of consultation time. Um, so if you're running in the middle of a run for whatever reason, at your place of business or private, whatever you're doing, and you have questions, as long as it's within business hours, feel free to contact me directly, send me a text message, an email, shoot me a call, whatever you feel comfortable doing. I'll do my best to answer as soon as I can um, and answer any questions you might have regarding the process. Now, regarding the video that was recorded uh, and live streamed today that showed everything, um, I will be working to get that published and available for you guys after the class here as soon as possible. Um, please work with me and give me a little bit of time. Uh, it is hosted on YouTube, so I need to confirm that there's a way to invite you individually private. Um, I just want to make sure that the content isn't left online for people to just ob obtain without you know, uh, going through the proper channels and p purchasing a ticket. So I need to do some diligence around that, but the content will be available. We also plan to do future distillation classes. So if you ever uh, want to join another session, you'd like to get in on just the, the lab portion and see another run or whether or not you want to see the lecture just by itself, you are welcome to join us for any future classes. Um, you will not pay the entire cost of a ticket. Uh, I believe the fee for the lab is $100 per person. So if you want to come back and just review it yourself, it's $100 as long as you have already purchased a ticket in the past. And you guys are more than welcome to come check out another lab we offer. Um, let's see, let's see. I don't think I have anything else left to cover. Again, I just want to say thank you guys for joining and participating today. And if you guys have any questions, you know how to reach out to you. We'll see you.